Four minutes after 10 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Actually, you know, the more you look at it, the, the more similar these two stories become. I, I, you know, Im- imposing a ban on smacking would be rather difficult. I, what, what are you going to do? Sort of publish a, a phone number for four-year-olds to ring if mum gives them a, a, a smack bottom for not eating their tea. And similarly, if you were born after 2000, and I mean, you're going to have some people who are right on the cusp of the smoking ban. So someone who was born literally the day before you will be allowed to go into a shop and buy uh, cigarettes, and you won't. So, that, that, I mean, I, I mean they, they are tricky. But sometimes legislation's not about uh, the things that are effective, isn't it? It, 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 it? Sometimes legislation is about messaging. So... I need today to be careful that the second hour of the programme, which at the moment is going to be about smacking, doesn't sound exactly the same as the first hour of the programme with just that one word difference, smoking being swapped for smacking. It's a shame there wasn't a big story about smartphones around today. That would have appealed to my slightly childish verbal enthusiasms because everything we talked about would have had S and M at the beginning, if you pardon the pun. Smoking, smacking and smartphones. Starting the day with a bit of S and M on LBC. uh, Yes, I'm fully aware of what I'm saying. Don't worry. Uh, But it's PMQs later as well, which I I suppose involves both sadism and masochism, depending on what your political proclivities are at this point in time. So the reason I'm talking about the smoking story today and didn't yesterday, that's partly because attention was inevitably focused on the Middle East yesterday and and will no doubt be again. But I I like the dust to settle a bit sometimes. I I like to have room i like a little bit of space sometimes to to think about what it is about a story that i find interesting so i love you you know i love you i love you deeply and 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 forever but if i come on air at 10 o'clock in the morning and say are you for or against i don't know that we engage each other particularly there'd be plenty of people happy to ring in and 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 contribute but are you for or against? And I could even keep, I don't know, keep a tally or something like that. And it's, it's not actually very interesting. What is interesting about this is the relationship between regulation and freedom. The relationship between regulation and freedom is at the heart of much of what we call politics. What should you, how, how free should you be to harm yourself or I suppose with smacking how free should you be to harm others and with smoking of course in fact the key difference you can't really do passive smacking can you so the key difference with these two topics would be the harm that you do to others by smoking in their presence so this idea that government exists to protect us from harm and sometimes even to protect us from ourselves, is one that I find intuitively difficult. I, I, I'm, I'm a fan of government intervention. I think that, that those of us born with privilege don't realise. Uh, do you know what story I always remember? And I, if you've been listening to, this, to, to this, this nonsense, if you've been listening to me for a while, I don't think I've, I've, I've picked up on this before, but I was remembering a story yesterday when I was thinking about this and trying to, if if you were trying to explain to someone who was open-minded enough to acknowledge that they might be wrong when they say, oh, we don't want government and we don't want the state and we don't want this and we don't want that. And people who say, you don't need lessons in childcare or you don't need lessons in this, that or the other. There was a story years ago, it may even have been before I started doing this, and it broke my heart to smithereens. It was one of the saddest things, one of the saddest, saddest stories I've ever read. And it was a story of a couple who'd had a baby. And they were not, I mean, this is long before the current cost of living crisis, but they were struggling. They were really struggling financially. And if memory serves, the court found, because for reasons that will soon become clear, they ended up in court. The court found that they were committed and completely loving parents. But the cost of baby food was prohibitive for them. So what they started doing was liquidizing their own dinner and giving that to the baby shortly after the baby was weaned. And the salt content was such, I think the baby might have died. Certainly got, I think, I think the baby died. Certainly got very, very ill because the salt content of their normal food. So they'd literally put a plate up 
a dinner and then liquidize it and feed it to the baby. And I, I don't know why. Some stories just get you, don't they? And of course, what that story brings to this conversation is the importance of recognizing that sometimes we do need almost protecting from ourselves. Sometimes we have to acknowledge that some people need to be taught stuff that we think is self-evident. And, and it does often break down on a right-left thing. That this 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 right wing libertarianism, which which usually means I really want to be able to do whatever I want to do, and therefore I'm an enemy of regulation. So think of someone like Jacob Rees Mogg, who would struggle to tie his own shoelaces, but if he hadn't been born with several silver spoons in his gob, I, goodness only knows what he would be doing for a living now. But he certainly wouldn't be close to a position in which he gets to influence uh, the, the direction of an entire country. But these people who, who just hate regulations because they've never really progressed beyond um, resentment at being told by Nanny to, to finish their peas or whatever it may be. That, that is so dangerous when you think about it because it, it negates the existence, it denies the reality of people who don't know. People who do need a little bit of help. And, and somehow that, for me, plays into the smoking story. Because I, I believe that I should be free to do things that are bad for me, right? If alcohol was invented today, do you think it would be legal this time next year? If, if alcohol was invented today, do you think it would be legal this time next year? I don't. Smoking, I, I, I have smoked over the years, not for a while now, but the freedom to do something that harms me is a really odd principle, isn't it? You can't ban everything that's harmful because, you know, you'd be banning I, I, almost everything has a network. You'd be banning chips. You'd be banning crisps. You'd be banning sweets. You'd be banning fizzy pop. You'd be banning alcohol obviously and you'd be banning cigarettes and they're only doing one of those but they've also banned or, or, or rendered illegal for example heroin or, or cocaine you can't pop out now and buy yourself a, a, a nice bag of meth crystal meth and and smoke it up before tuning into the big show. These these are illegal acts. These are crimes. But why? Because I think you should be free to do stuff that's bad for you, especially if you really enjoy it. But I don't, do I think that? Because I approve of the smoking ban, and I don't think that you should be able to pop to Morrison's and buy a little bag of crystal meth before breakfast, or indeed after breakfast. So where is this line? Isn't it a strange one? All of this is a, a very roundabout way of moving towards the question I said I wasn't going to ask you, because I am going to ask you that question, but I've demonstrated, I hope, that you need to think about it a bit. Okay. Richard suggests that if milk was invented today, it would be illegal. It'd be a bit hard to invent milk, Richard. I mean, sure, what came first? <laughs> the milk or the cow? <laughs> so... The rule is mad, right? It, the rule is absolutely bonkers. The more I think about it, the more bonkers this rule becomes. If you were born after 2009, you will not be allowed to buy cigarettes. So when you reach your majority in 2027, which is not far off, or even 2025, actually, I think, isn't it? So it's next year, probably. You, you walk into a shop, and a shopkeeper, we should probably speak to a couple of shopkeepers. A shopkeeper in, in 30 years' time, right? <laughs> in 30 years' time, a shopkeeper is going to have to distinguish between a 46-year-old and a 47-year-old. I've probably got the numbers wrong. Don't at me. So, so you're working in your shop, and you've got, you're still selling cigarettes in plain packaging. Um, I was once sold clotted cream under the counter in, in Devon. Did I ever tell you? They weren't supposed to be selling clotted cream. They didn't have the right credentials and the right certificates, but he sort of made sure the coast was clear. I said, do you want to buy some clot? Do you want to buy some clotted cream? I said, yeah. Well, have you, have you got the good stuff? He goes, yeah, I got some really good stuff here. He said, so he looks at it and he pulls it out from under. There. That's what cigarettes are going to be like. But if you're 47, you you will be allowed to buy them. Well, so all the 46 year olds will be waiting outside the news agents, saying to the 47, excuse me, Mister, can you buy me 20 Bensons? To the 46, excuse me, mate, how old are you? 47. 
my, my fine young fellow. Oh, Splake, can you buy us 20 Bensons, please, mister? Is, 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 I don't know, 400 pounds it'll probably be. It's 400 quid. Can you buy me 20 Bensons, mister? So it's an absolutely bonkers piece of legislation. And yet I think everybody sensible recognises that it's also good. So how can something bonkers be good? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. I've got I can't I'm not gonna shake that image now of a forty six year old tapping up a forty seven year old outside outside the seven eleven to say, Excuse me, mister, can you get us twenty Benson? Um how can it be both bonkers and good at the same time? In fact I'd go further. I think bonkers and brilliant. Because it is brilliant. The Daily Mirror's headline was the one that stopped me in my tracks today. I, I, I forget it precisely, but it was something like, Parliament votes for smoking ban, but Tories still want more death. <laughs> and you sort of thought, yeah. And that is how it breaks down. The Tories that voted against it, um, some of the more prominent ones, are, are essentially doing what they like to call virtue signalling to libertarian potential donors. So they're trying to keep the mad think tanks that propelled Liz Truss into Downing Street on side. They're trying to keep potential... They're the kind of people that make donate, secret donations to weird lobby groups that call themselves think tanks, also make big donations to political parties. Liz Truss has shown that you can grease a politician's passage all the way to Downing Street by keeping these mad Tufton Street vampires and client journalists on side. So people like Kemi Badenoch and Honest Bob Jenrick, they, they are calculating that the path to the leadership, even though a significant majority of Tory voters think that this is good politics, think that this is a good idea, they've calculated that the path to the leadership still involves a sort of trust 2.0. Vice signalling, you could call it. Thank you, whoever texted that. But it's bonkers and brilliant at the same time. I want you to explain it to me, okay? 16 minutes after 10. There's no way this will work, but I really, really like it. And I suspect you're the same. Unless you don't like it, in which case, in many ways, you can go straight to the front of the queue. But you need to explain yourself, and you need to explain yourself well. We are bringing in a rule which, oddly, is pretty much the only original idea Rishi Sunak has come up with in the last two years. And he has had his, I think, biggest rebellion yet from his own MPs, whose positioning in the polls is pitiful and who um, are actually on the wrong side of history on this, when you look at every single constituency, every caucus of voter, except, guess what? Conservative Party members. Not voters, but members. The people that elect the next leader. Potentially. Ultimately. So, it's absolutely mad. In fact, even Boris Johnson has called it absolutely nuts. And when's the last time I agreed with Boris Johnson about anything? But I only agree with him to the end of that sentence it's absolutely nuts full stop but it's also brilliant why oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three is the number that you need so so how can something that is impossible to implement simultaneously be the right thing to do and if you're on the other side of this you you I, i'm still winnable how do we draw the line between the things you are free to do to yourself that are bad for you and potentially bad for others, you know, diesel cars, and the things that you shouldn't be allowed to do to yourself because it's bad for you? So I don't know if you're familiar with 2000 AD, the, 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 the comic. They were quite ahead of the curve on many, many things. Judge Dredd, you probably know the figure of Judge Dredd. I think Sylvester Stallone made a film. But they had this, this, this very um, prescient phenomenon in their pages. It was set in 2000 AD, right, which was 24 years ago, but it was written in the 60s and the 70s, so it seemed like this distant, far-off, futuristic scenario. And they had, like, uh, I remember it, actually, and I think that if a kid was caught smoking... Judge Dredd would take the kid to this place, which was like a tent for all the smokers. The only places in 2000 AD that you were allowed to smoke were these massive tents. These massive tents. 
and it, it would i mean you barely needed to light up if you were in them you may have seen something similar at airports in greece you barely needed to light up if you were in one because you could just walk in and breathe in everybody else's fumes I and mean, they were absolutely dis- disgusting absolutely disgusting but they could have done that right they could have just made smoking for everybody harder and harder and harder but they haven't they've made it illegal for anybody born after 2009 and yet somehow i really like it so so tell me why you don't i am winnable on this oddly because fundamentally fundamentally i don't know whether it's my sort of stubborn boarding school attitude I, I i want to be free to do things that are bad for me so well there you go i've waffled for long enough should we just open up the phone lines and let you waffle as well i think it's one of those mornings isn't it really go on give us a ring share your thoughts oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three is the number you need and if you hit those numbers now you will get through and you can have a go if you want to, if you want to keep it a bit simpler why not alcohol why smoking but not alcohol? It's 20 past 10. James O'Brien on LBC. I'm also still broadly in favour of the decriminalisation or the legalisation of cannabis. So I, 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 it's not as harmful as tobacco, but, but in terms of civil liberties, I just want your help today in pinning down what these, what these distinctions are. But I, but I have to tell you, um, Emma's done a, done a Google... And I was right about that story. It was 25 years ago. A, 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 little, a little boy called Lee Elders, three months old, died from salt poisoning after his young parents fed him adult food because they could not afford expensive baby meals. Next time you hear some predictable right-wing blowhard banging on about how you don't need to teach people that, it's all obvious, or if you don't need that, just, just think of little Lee. That was an absolutely heartbreaking story. His mum, only 18, from Doncaster, said at the time, we were just giving him what we thought was extra good food to boost his diet. I never suspected, as we are now told, that it was poisoning him. 23 after 10 is the time. Let's start with the smoking. Let's start indeed in Barcelona. Sebastian is there. Sebastian, what would you like to say? Hi, James. How are you doing? Very well. What's on your mind? Good, good. Well, um, it's, the, it's the subject of government um, harming... Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, stopping people from harming themselves. Um, when I was 14, I started smoking behind the back of the science block at Hampstead Comprehensive School, as a lot of people did. Uh, and... You know, uh, it was it was all a bit of fun at first. Yes. And then, you know, the rest of my life for well, not the rest of my life until I found recovery from addiction, yes. because it did. It literally cigarettes led to cannabis, led to uh, sniffing glue, to Tipex thinner, to uh, uh, cocaine. Once I got older to uh, I never I never took heroin. Strangely, well done. Um, although the opportunity was, of, it was I, I begged, I begged someone to once, but they didn't let me because they didn't have enough. Really? Um, yeah. So, but that's how an addict rolls, right? When you're, when you're, once you're taken by it, once you're, <laughs> that's why people sit around in groups going, "Hi, I'm Sebastian. I'm an addict." Right? Yes. Be- because, um, or they might not say Sebastian. Obviously, it's a bit of a plot. Bit, bit weird if they them. did, wouldn't they? I mean, if every single addict in the country was called, or indeed if every single addict went to Hampstead Comprehensive School, that would be terrible for Ofsted. But uh, but on we go. Yeah, well, I can't say what people say at meetings, but you do hear a I lot understand. of weird. But yeah, it's quite, of course. It's, it's all good. It's all good. Yeah, t- but, just um, just watch your mouth a bit, if you would, Sebastian. We had to we had to dump oh, it because sorry, a few words you sorry. can't say on the radio. But that's fine. Don't worry uh, about it. Yeah, I got a bit loose out here in Barcelona, probably. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so the thing is that essentially, look back to the point. Um, you know, there, there was a. You know, you used to be able to go into Fowler's, and I sound like an old man here, but you used to be able just to go just hang on. Let me help you focus a bit. Buy well, a single cigarette. Yeah, but you so, can well, go into Fowler's and buy a bottle of wine still. So what is it about tobacco that deserves this treatment when there are lots of other things? I mean, and you've given a list of things. No one's ever banned glue or indeed Tipex no. thinner. So, so what, what is it about tobacco that deserves this treatment when so many other things which do us harm and to which we be- can become addicted do not deserve this treatment? Well, personally, it's, yeah. you're burning a carcinogenic substance and it's going into your lungs. Um, it's which is instantly harmful. I mean, you wouldn't take a, a, I suppose you're not allowed to really put a knife in yourself or put anything that you know is definitely going to harm you. 
eventually one way or the other and others this is another thing so it's the popularity of it that it's it's, it's become a victim of its own popularity if it was as if smoking was as popular as glue sniffing we wouldn't be having this conversation would we um well smoking is a lot you mean if glue sniffing was as popular as smoking yeah uh yeah no uh, well i think we still would be having this conversation because it's in a way it's not the item Uh, often it's it's well so I can only talk for myself. I can't talk for other people with regards to addiction, right? Because there are so many different levels of but that, it. But you can. You can, you can. I only want you to speak for yourself. Why tobacco and not any of the other things? Like whiskey. Well, it was readily available. Gary Finley. This like whiskey. Like whiskey. Like, like booze. Why tobacco and not booze for the ban? Because what? the... Well, well no, I, I agree also there should be limits on booze as well. I mean, personally, for me... Well, there are I, limits I on booze. There, there are age limits and things like that. But but I just, just I, I want to get down. I want to zone in on this tension between being free to do things that harm us. I, I, would we ban skydiving? And I know you could say, and I'm not making light of it, but there are recorded cases of people landing on others when skydiving and doing, doing them harm. But obviously, you're not immediate. Passive skydiving isn't really a phenomenon, is it? So, Dad, what, what is it? And, and give me the libertarian argument, because I think that 20 years ago, you'd have had me on your team. It, 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 I mean, the world has turned. It's turned even more on smacking. But I think 20 years ago, you can't ban people. This is outrageous. Absolutely outrageous. I should be free to do something that's bad for me. Michael's in Watford. Michael, what's going on? Um, well, yeah, I think um, I think you're completely right, and I think it's it's. To be I honest, can't be I, completely oh, right. I'm confused. I don't know what I'm thinking. You can't ring. I can't. I say I don't know whether yes, I'm coming or going do. this morning, and yes, then you ring up and say I completely do. agree with you, James. So do you tell me what you think, not what you think I think. I think I think that to be honest, it's it's laughable because the solution is right there, staring at everybody, and for some reason, no one mentioned it yet. You should be completely free to do whatever you want as an adult, right? Yeah. Yes, we should monitor how old you are when you start smoking, drinking, doing this or doing that 100%. You shouldn't be banning anything all the way because you're an adult. Mm. But why should we or the NHS pay um, in a situation where you start damaging your health? So I think it should be the other way around. It should be if you have health-related re- uh, issues to smoking, then why should the NHS pay for it? What about football? You should be charged. What about football? What about if you break your knee playing football? Why should I pay for that? I don't play football. Well, because uh, the, the football is not basically all the way harmful. No, but it is, it is if you've broken your knee. Not everyone. If you bro- not I- everyone. Lots of not people smoke and don't football. get lung cancer. Lots of people smoke and don't get lung cancer. Lots of people yes, smoke and don't die. Have, but they are going to have other uh, health issues, not just... How cancer. are you going to know? How are you going to know which health issues are linked to smoking and which ones aren't? What about the people who have health issues born of passive smoking? How are you going to prove that it was passive smoking and that they weren't actually smoking? Everyone who turns up at hospital under your glorious rule is going to say, oh, I can't believe it. I've been sitting next to Bob for the last 30 years. He smokes 40 a day and now I've got emphysema. So you can't charge me. You should charge Bob. He was the smoker. I was just breathing in his secondhand smoke. I think the reason why no one has suggested this before, Michael, is because it's a bit silly. <laughs> no, I mean, someone I should have called in. I should have actually <laughs> processed it first before calling in. <laughs> never do that, Michael. Promise me, never. No, I'll be out of a job. People start processing and thinking everything through before they ring in. Half past ten. I, and again, I, I mean, I, my initial response to that is, is warm. Yeah, you're right. If you are going to, re- I always remember a bloke called Bob. Bob, he's a lovely bloke. I had this weird job before I could drive in Norwich, and I was living in Cambridge. And uh, the, 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 for some reason, Mrs. O'Brien charged me with finding somewhere for us to live. I found a lovely cottage in the middle of nowhere. We've been living in London, and, and I just got off the showbiz beat, and I just thought, this is going to be amazing. It's wildlife. It's go- and, and then Mrs. O'Brien could drive at the time. And she was still working in London. And we got there, and we moved in, literally the night we moved in, because we'd been living separately for, for a couple of months when I started this job in Norwich. And she said, how, what are you going to do? Should we, you, how are you going to get to work and stuff? I said, well, there's... And I'd actually managed to rent a house for six months without thinking about... So I ended up putting a local taxi driver on retainer. He, he would meet me every day. I paid a little less than what I would have paid, but he was called Bob. Worked out of Ely in Cambridgeshire. And I always remember he once said to me, he said to me, he said, you know, James, he said, if, if, you, if it were absolutely guaranteed 
that the all the all the taxes from my fags went directly to the NHS. He said I'd smoke twice as much. I said what? He said if it, you showed me if you could prove that all the fat all the taxes on my fags went directly to the NHS. I'd smoke twice as much. I really would. I'd smoke 40. I'd I smoke 20 a day. I'd smoke 40. He'd been around. He'd travelled a lot at Bob. That's why he had this quite a strange accent. It didn't really put him down in any precise location. But he kind of has a point. Although I'm not sure how helpful it is in our quest this morning for complete clarity on the on the question of when is it good for the government to stop us doing things that are bad for us and when is it bad for the government to stop us doing things that are bad for us. It's 10.32. Amelia Cox has your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. <laughs> I love it. Man. You all make the same joke. Simon Garrett says, that poor taxi driver must have had a long day having to get to Cambridge by a Somerset each day. And uh, you didn't say your smoking friend writes, James. <laughs> Bob was the same fellow who's <laughs> <laughs> Who sold you clotted cream in the West Country? Uh, this is from Jimmy in Fulham. Your impressions of them both sounded exactly the same. Um, uh, it, it, yes, all right. You're all hilarious. Um, and Tamsin says, did Bob spend a lot of time in Pakistan? No, he didn't spend a lot of time. They were very... Guy on the Island Man. Amazing that Bob from Ely was also the Devon clotted cream seller. They were very different accents, actually. The clotted cream seller spoke like this. He did. Would you like to buy some Clyde cream, he said. And Bob from Ely said, oh, James, I'd smoke twice I'd smoke twice as much if it went directly to the... That's not the same accent. One's Norfolk, one's Devon. Yeah, all right. Take it up with someone else. I'm busy. 25 to 11 is the time. We're talking about the smoking ban. Trevor's in Wokingham, or Smokingham, as perhaps it could be called today. Yeah, Smokingham. Yeah. I'm the leafy suburb. Ch- cheers. Doing? Damn all right. What's on your mind? I, I was just listening to you talking, and I think that's a relief. you're drawing equivalent to sort of smoking and alcohol, smoking and chips, smoking and football. But there's an order of magnitude, and I don't agree or disagree. I kind of like my freedoms. Yes. But there's an order of magnitude to the damage that smoking does. Yes. You know, the people that it kills versus alcohol. Yeah. I think it's four or five times. Is it? Is it? Really? It's some crazy number. Yeah, there's okay. an order of magnitude to long term. There's not really and, such a thing as as moderate smoking, is there? In, in in I mean, there is technically a thing, but but you're just as likely to get ill as a, or not just as likely, but there's no, but you know what I'm saying, no benign yeah. smoking, as it were. It's polar. You could smoke one, or your yeah. grand that smokes eighty a day for fifty yeah, yeah. years and was absolutely fine. So I think there's that. The secondary smoking, and you might, I mean, you probably remember Roy Castle as well. I remember Roy yeah, Castle, you know, played trumpet in bars, ended up getting lung cancer. He did. His, his, his widow, Fiona, used to listen to the show. She used to get in touch quite a lot, actually, with the programme. And, and, and for younger listeners who don't know, Roy Castle was a big, big television presenter when we were children, but he was actually originally famous as a jazz trumpeter, and he, he was one of the first sort of poster boys almost wasn't he for for for, for lung cancer as a consequence of yeah. having never smoked but having spent a lot of time in smoky environments yeah so i think i i understand that and you can't i mean greasy chips i get what you're saying banned greasy food but mm. i think what i was saying to the person on the phone that answered was if you ban smoking tomorrow if no one smokes tomorrow no great harm would come you if you start banning food groups you, you, food is necessary for people to live and some people will, you know, chips will be what they'll need to eat. It's yeah. when you look at sort of cost of food and ultra processed food. So no, no one's ever killed anyone smoke driving, have they? No, no, they haven't. That's but not quite the zinger that I, I was hoping for, but it's a, it's a pertinent point that Paige makes on, on, on a text. So you do, I, you, there are harms linked to drinking that don't apply to smoking, but no one's going to get past the numbers game, are they? on this you're here with the numbers game trevor yeah i mean to a point but then if i think about something that's comparable to smoking that's bad speeding you know no one really needs to speed i thought you said breastfeeding then i thought good god this has taken an unexpected turn oh everyone needs to do that no no, i I thought what's he on about now it's all gone a bit you kip but no you said speeding no one needs yes so speeding is illegal so no one needs to speed it kills people it's attributed to X amount of road deaths. But yeah. again, it, it's not necessary. I mean, you could argue the point of, uh, I need to go a bit faster every now and then. Speeding, smoking, two things. If they're stopped tomorrow, fewer people die, There's people no are healthier. Downside. No one's going to go hungry. And 
I think if you ban alcohol, actually, I, I agree with you. Drunk drivers. Well, that's already illegal. Alcohol. Actually, quite a lot of people are pointing out that that is already illegal. But you would, but you could, uh, you could eradicate it or come a lot closer to eradicating it if alcohol was illegal. But it doesn't feel the same. I am indulging in what aboutery, which is something I often accuse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I accuse other people of it. Just smoking is unique. Do you know what might be closest to it? Despite your comments about greasy chips, sugar, sugar or salt. Yeah, oh, well, I think you need salt. I, I, I don't know that you need sugar, uh, uh, but but sugar, uh, the way they've pumped sugar into everything. I mean, like granulated formula sugar, not 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 fructose and stuff. But that that I don't know. Do we live in a world where someone tries to ban sugar? Thank you, Trevor, in Smokingham. It's ten thirty nine. George is in Bristol. George, what would you like to hey. say? Hello. Yeah. Um, I just heard you uh, talk about glue sniffing and all of that. And uh, I think smoking is kind of unique, as you just said, Mm. um, because there are no sort of auxiliary benefits. That's the word I wanted, auxiliary benefits. Are there any auxiliary benefits to alcohol? Um, It has a social function, doesn't it? So does smoking. People like... Not, not quite the same, though, is it? Because you don't no. sort of go to the pub to have For a, a cigarette. Smoke. And, you know, exactly. No. Um, and people don't sort of enjoy the feeling of a cigarette on a night out, or it's like it doesn't loosen you up in the same way as alcohol might do. I mean, well, oddly, alcohol, it does briefly if you're addicted, but that's not, that, that, that's not really yeah, a challenge to your analysis, thing, really, is it? Is it? Yeah. No, it's not. Yeah. How old are you, if you don't mind me asking? I'm um, 33. That's an interesting age. That's an, Why do you say that? Well, because you are 20 years younger than me and 20 years older than a 13-year-old, which is the age at roughly many people begin to sort of flirt with, with tobacco. So if we were doing this generationally, you're the midpoint. You're the, you're the control, and, and you didn't grow up with cigarette smoking being as normal as breathing in public spaces. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, and, and if I, I was your age, I wouldn't have any of this sort of residual libertarian position about, well, hang on, I should be free to harm myself, but because I think it's born of familiarity. I, we would go to pubs and nightclubs, and the majority of people in there would be smoking for the duration of your time indoors. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I live in Germany, actually, most of the time. Oh, yeah. And, and, and there, in the pubs and clubs, like, people smoke all the time. Do they it's still? It's completely normalised. I didn't yeah, know yeah, that. Yeah. It's, 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 you, you'd be surprised. Oh, yeah, I am surprised. You live um, and learn, eh? Um, yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I think there's a consensus emerging. My, my, but but the, 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 the consensus is directed at that specific question of why this is different from other substances. Uh, so why did these Tories vote against it? We can throw in a little bit of politics on this one. What is this libertarian position that people like Kemi Badenoch and Honest Bob Jenrick uh, apparently espouse? Um, that That's quite interesting. It's the biggest rebellion, I think, that uh, uh, Rishi Sunak has suffered. Two ex-prime ministers voted um, uh, against it or certainly opposed it. I like the comment from the health secretary, Victoria Atkins. She said, there is no liberty in addiction. But I haven't even checked yet. But I can guarantee you that various vampiric institutions in the vicinity of Tufton Street in, uh, in central London, they will be opposed to this. Um, and, of course, when it is reported, when someone finally manages to produce the evidence that these outfits take money from the tobacco lobby, everyone carries on booking them for their programmes anyway and treating them as honest brokers and inviting them to write comment pieces for the Daily Telegraph. But but apart from people who are um, secretly funded, although occasionally the truth slips out, by the tobacco lobby, who, 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 who's got a problem with this? What's Kemi Badenoch? I, I mean, hard to understand what's going on in her mind at the best of times, but on this occasion, what is going on there? Does she not give two figs either way, but she thinks there might be more um, political capital in opposing it than there is in supporting it? Dan is in Tamworth. Dan, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Uh, first time caller, long time listener. Welcome, Dan. Thank you. Um, I just felt like picking up the phone today because I am absolutely delighted that my son will never legally be able to buy tobacco yeah. if this goes through. Um, I've always been terrified um, of my son because obviously when they get a bit older, teenagers, you cannot 
uh, control what they're doing behind the bike sheds, etc. No. Um, and I've lost relatives to uh, smoking. Um, I grew up in the 80s and everyone smoked. Every room was smoke-filled. Yeah, I remember. Um, I've watched people um, literally uh, lose their life uh, because of it. And um, I, I'm absolutely delighted. I am by no means a fan of the Conservative government, but mm. I think this is one of the most wonderful things that they've ever proposed. Even though it's bonkers? Because when your son, who, what is he now? He's nine. He, he's nine, yeah. Right, so he'd have to find someone, born in 2000, who's 15. He'd have to find someone six, six years older than him. So yeah. when he's 50, yeah. and he's hanging around outside the newsagents, and, 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 and if he can find a 56-year-old to go in and buy him 20 Benson, then, he, then he's laughing. So you, you see what I mean about how daft it is on one level. Absolutely. I mean, uh, but you also see underage kids all the time vaping these days. Yeah, vaping they're is a bit le- of an issue, isn't it? That's yeah, the, that's the yeah, big problem now. Not, yeah, they're not legally allowed to be uh, buying vapes. They do find a way, but as far as I'm concerned, whatever extra barrier is there for my son can only be a good thing. I, I really like it. It's nudge. Is it nudge theory? I, whatever it is that you just change behaviour. So the behaviour probably of people who are allowed to smoke, people who were born in 2009 or before 2009 but don't currently smoke they are massively less likely to take up smoking now because the culture around it is changing so much and this is a massive contribution to the culture change so that your your boy will not grow up thinking that it's rebellious or, or naughty or cool or any of the things that tempted our generation to do it when we were teenagers yeah, absolutely i mean um everyone was doing it when i was uh, at school luckily I, I never uh i had really my parents smoked but they always um drove home how bad it was uh, and how they couldn't Funny start that, so it? i never took it up that's parenting 101 do, do as i say not as i do Ten forty-five is the time you're listening to james o'brien on lbc don't forget that it's wednesday and also they're back from holidays so there is pmqs today natasha will be joining us at um shortly before 12 to have a look at what is likely or or unlikely to come up and it's a tricky one today isn't it the polls continue it's reaching that point now where I heard someone on with Nick this morning. I, I, forgive me, I, I wasn't sure who it was, but, but I guess another Tory who's leaving at the next election, trying to make a case, bless him, for um, the Tories winning the next general election. Never say never. It, it, is, it, is, it is a possibility, but the misunderstanding of what happened in 1997 is so widespread. We're hearing exactly the same conversations in, in, in 1997 about they're not that into Labour, they've just had enough of the Tories. Um, but history's a strange thing. People can be very, very forgetful. Um, they're back. So what what, what it's going to look like now, PMQs, well, are we just going to have six months of, of this weird, stagnant purgatory in Parliament? Or, or, or is something going to give? Is something going to break? We will find out. 10.46 is the time. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 10 to 11 and you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I've got quite a good unhinged headline for you today. It, it's, a, it's, a double, it's a double whammy, this. It's an unhinged headline and then it's got a very clever comment from the history guy, Dan Snow. I'm not just calling him the history guy, like a history guy, like I'd be the, I don't know, the Brexit guy. That's what he calls himself. He is known as the history guy. He's a brilliant bloke, Dan. Um, so I'll do, the, I'll do the unhinged headline first. Are we, can we, okay, let's do it. Unhinged headline. Exclusive. Liz Truss says the power exercised in Britain by unelected people is a scandal. She's given an interview to a columnist at the Daily Telegraph called Alison Pearson. This is, if you're a fan of the original Ghostbusters, this is like the streams crossing, potentially. I I don't know that this should have been allowed to happen, that these two particular streams should have been permitted to cross. But cross they have. And Liz Truss has shared this gem. The power exercised in Britain by unelected people is a scandal. To which Dan Snow, the history guy, has responded by saying, very winningly, she was appointed by a hereditary monarch without recourse to a general election. This is the thing that I'm finding quite fascinating about Liz Truss. She's got a book out, by the way. I don't know if you're aware of that. Um, It's as if she operates in a universe where she's never come across Liz Truss. 
Do, do you see what I mean? It's it's to be there's you can be a bit detached from reality and you can be a little bit delusional. I I mean, look, Brexit is the ultimate in political delusion, continuing delusion, continuing to pretend that it isn't uh, failing to deliver any of the things that people were promised it would deliver, r- regardless of whether or not you want to pretend that you like spending more money for food and not being able to move to Spain anymore or whatever it might be or, or, or you know. She seems to operate in this mad space where she doesn't know anything she's done. I was trying to make sense of it last night, and this is the best I can do. It's as if she's in one of those Hollywood films where they have the same date every day. Like the woman, Jennifer Aniston, wakes up and she can't remember anything. So Ben Stiller has to has to woo her anew every day. That's not an actual film, but it, it, it nearly was. Do you see what I mean? So Liz Truss says things that seem to display a complete ignorance of anything Liz Truss has ever done. And that's the best example of today. The power exercised in Britain by unelected people is a scandal, says a woman appointed by a hereditary monarch without recourse to a general election. How do you do that? How do you do that? How can you go, oh, I'm very, uh, yes, power exercised, unelected, and and not realise that you were unelected, essentially, certainly on a national level, and that a hereditary monarch, also unelected, kind of nodded you through? Anyway, 10.53 is the time. I'm tempted to ask what they've been smoking, but um, that would be inappropriate. Although I think we can probably all agree there is a historical anomaly. There's a certain absurdity to tobacco having been legal for all of these years while cannabis was illegal. I I, I suspect that in the not-too-distant future, that situation would have been almost completely reversed. Uh, James is in Ely. Have you got a, a... Oh, in Cardiff, though, not in Cambridgeshire. Hey, I, I was going to start doing some accent-based banter with you, but thankfully I yeah, spotted... Yeah, I would have loved to it, it's, it's, one. It, it's it would have been the, really strange. It's the wrong Ely. What would you like to yeah. say? What made you pick up on this one? Um, well, I was just talking about it. I just, I just think that any sort of limit on restriction just tends to usually sort of disproportionately affect the lower classes, I find. and Or, you know, or poorer not, people, certainly. Yeah, poorer people. Yeah. And obviously, I mentioned I'm from Ely and Cardiff, which is one of the sort of lower income suburbs. Is one it? of the worst ones, really. And I've grown up here for 25 years. And I've seen different sort of implementations come in with regards to different sort of vices that people have. The Welsh Government, um, maybe three or four years ago, introduced minimum alcohol unit pricing. Yeah. Um, that didn't change anything. All that did was just the people who I see who are the most affected by alcohol abuse, you know, I haven't seen any sort of change in the amount of alcohol they're consuming. That, that is anecdotal. I, th- I think the science suggests that, that that did go all right, that that introduction. Okay, well, anecdotal is also... But that's fine. My, I mean, uh, anecdotes are interesting. Say again, sorry? Uh, anecdotes are interesting, and, and yeah, it, it, it hasn't yeah. helped anyone in your circle that it was ostensibly designed to help. Not in my circle, just people I might happen to be yeah. you know, judging, watching, whatever. Yeah. Um, but also, another point I had was, I, I'm a civil engineer in my final u- uh, year of university, and it's a completely irrelevant topic, but um, my dissertation was on the 20 mile per hour implementation um, that the Welsh Government imposed in September 2023, yes. changing all 30 mile per hour roads to 20 mile per hour roads. It wasn't all of them, um, was it? Oh, well, that's the that's the that's one of the things I talked about in my dissertation. Okay. Is it going to be all of them? Is it not? Anyway, I as part of my dissertation, I interviewed 40 uh, van drivers at the delivery company that I work for. Yeah. And I asked them 10 different questions. One of the questions was, during off-peak times, do you notice the implementation much during... Uh, peak times, school hours, rush hours, whatever, do you notice um, the effects? People said that during peak times, not really, they're, they're not I, really... I'm going uh, to have to urge you to be relevant. I hope that doesn't sound rude. No, that's that's the thing. I am I am coming into it. Um, yeah, but you need so, to hurry up. You need to get to the relevant bit quicker. Right, okay. Well, basically, people don't like being told what to do, which is that's what true. my server results found. Yeah. I found people were, <laughs> deliberate, people were deliberately exceeding the speed limit. Uh, more at 20 miles per hour. Yeah, than still not seeing why it's relevant to the smoking. You need you need to speak to your people at LBC, mate, because when I told her this, she was buzzing. She she was happy to get me on the call. So, okay, that's not yeah. true. Right, okay then. They're absolutely Fair adamant enough. that you didn't tell anybody about your thesis at university being 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 great. Right, okay. 
So, Good. do you want to, can you in a sentence say something interesting? Free Palestine. Okay. Um, Ewan's in Halifax. Ewan, what would you like to say? Um, I want to say, hi, James. I'm first time caller, nervous and all that. Um, That's only I'm, me. You can't yeah, be as bad as the last bloke, mate. So, it's win win, isn't it? Yeah, well, um, I'm I'm young. I'm only 19, but uh, my dad smokes. My dad's mum smokes heavily. Right. Loads of mates I have um, heavily, uh, not heavily smoke, but drink um, smoking out, drinking in very socially. At, at your and, age and smoking cigarettes, smoking tobacco, not um, vapes. No, some people do both. They do right. they do either or. They'll sometimes on, they'll, the dry time they'll have a vape on them and also smoke cigarettes on, throughout the night. But basically, it's I don't necessarily think that I think that banning's a good thing. Um, I've seen the effects that it has on like people I know and yeah. you know the coughing and all that type of stuff. But I don't think that people that want to smoke and people that in people that um, basically are allowed they'll to find smoke a way their age, if they want find to. A way. Yeah, it's, yeah, but the numbers are going to be negligible. You see, that's yeah, no, the point. I, I think um, you're right, but that, that's why I'm talking about a culture change. I don't think anyone is going to be going to court. Certainly not in that catchment of born on december the 31st 2008 uh, uh, at one minute to midnight not allowed it is allowed to smoke and then one minute after midnight not allowed to smoke that's never going to happen is it but 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 the the world in which both of those people live is a world in which smoking has just become something a little bit odd and weird and dirty yeah i i agree and that's that's the way it's like the it's like the devil's advocate in the sense of Basically, it's it's one smoking is good for the economy because it's regulated and we tax off it a lot. But obviously, you don't know where it goes. Like your story about the taxi driver, but also, um, we're always going to smoke nonetheless. It's I think it's it's good, and I agree with it because I don't I don't want to be getting lung cancer and all that type of stuff from people smoking around me. But I think that if people want to smoke, they're going to find a way to smoke, um, no matter what happens. I think. I, yeah, except that they will be a tiny, tiny number. And also, who's going to be that person who actually, that, that person born after 2009, I'm determined to smoke. I'll leave you with two thoughts. The first is of that 46-year-old hanging around outside a petrol station asking people, passing adults how old they are until he finds a 47-year-old. Or indeed a 48 or a 5, and, and, and gives him some money and asks if... Uh, um, you can buy me 20 Bensons. And, and the second is, I, I, someone else has just pointed this out, as our friend in Ely a moment ago, reminding us why we don't do motoring conversations on this programme. And who'd have thought that in a conversation about the smoking ban, someone would be able to pop up and remind us why uh, radio phone-ins about boring motoring-related issues are generally anathema between 10 and 1. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 11.03. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. We could have gone with smearing, I suppose, couldn't we? This Angela Rayner story is still being desperately inflated by um, right-wing newspapers and, and about various politicians. Matthew Paris in The Times today is actually worth reading on the subject. Matthew Paris, uh, himself a former Conservative uh, member of Parliament and uh, 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 been around the block quite a few times. He, he's a columnist and... and I know that you're probably going to text me now and say he's the bloke that wrote this thing and you shouldn't praise him. But I like columnists who take me by surprise. Some of the things he's written I found pretty pretty gross. And some of the things he's written I have found extraordinarily good. But um, that's good. I don't like the columnist. You, you name a columnist, I'll tell you what their view is on, on a given subject, even if they've never expressed their view on a given subject. It's not a coincidence, is it? that it, it, people have the same views. Like it's, it's almost like, a, I'm probably a bit guilty of this. I don't imagine I surprise you very often. That's why I like columnists like Matthew Paris. I think it makes them more valuable. It's as if they are unconfined by uh, a, a kind of tribal loyalty. So I, I thought this was very good. Um, the hounding of Angela Rayner is outrageous, brutal, snobbish, and completely out of proportion to any mistake she may or may not have made. And that bracket there, or, 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 or may not, is crucial, isn't it? Because even if she is found to have done something wrong, as Matthew Paris writes, the sums are tiny, and the issue itself has always been a matter of public confusion, the deeming of a property as a main residence for capital gains tax purposes I, it, it is truly extraordinary that one of boris johnson's closest allies and backers is currently under investigation for a potential uh tax issue that has so many noughts after it that it looks like a telephone number i don't know it it, it it actually looks bigger than a telephone number and you're probably unaware of that and you probably don't know his name 
And I'm not even going to say it in case I've misre- misremembered or, or slightly misrepresented the facts. And yet the possible, possible failure to pay a couple of grand in capital gains tax for a house Angela Rayner bought before she was a politician continues to be on the front pages. If I were attached to the Labour Party officially, I'd be oddly torn about this because part of me would be saying, good God, we've got them on the run. Look at this now. This makes Keir Starmer's curry look serious. This is incredible. Why do they keep advertising how desperate they are? And the client journalists who are queuing up to inflate this story, as Matthew Paris writes, regardless of whether she's done anything wrong or not, this reaction, this level of reporting is ridiculous. So we could have done... um, smear today we could have done smoking smacking and smearing and we'd have had three s one day i'm going to do a show where all three topics can be distilled down to a single word that sounds similar to the other two words that the other two topics have been distilled down to but sadly today is not that day we move from smoking to smacking while aware that pmqs is on the horizon at 12 noon and i like this story for reasons similar to why I liked the smoking story, it's because it's it, it, it's an obviously good thing to do, but it's not immediately obvious how it will be done. So parents in England and Northern Ireland are currently allowed to smack their children. Uh, and parents in Wales and Scotland are not. So again, if we're going to go back to our 46-year-old hanging around outside a petrol station asking a 47-year-old to buy him 20 Bensons, this means that if you live in Berwick-upon-Tweed, um, you, you can you can hit your child, but if you drive five miles north, you can't. So if, you, if you're Scottish and you really want to hit your child, all you've got to do at the moment is drive to England, where you will be able to do it with impunity. Or will you? I don't know. If you drive back to Scotland and get reported to the authorities there, can you be prosecuted for doing something that you did in a, in a, in a territory where it was actually permissible and legal to do it, but you live in a territory where it's, where it's not... You see what I mean about it being a slightly odd legislative conundrum. But it is the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health who have called for this. They have described it as a scandal that Scotland and Wales had outlawed smacking, um, but that the other two home nations had not. And, and the, evidence, the evidence is not really up for debate. Smacking children does make them... Well, I mean, actually, maybe there's a little bit of debate on the causation and correlation thing here. Smacked children are much more likely to suffer poor mental health, do badly at school, and be physically assaulted or abused. I don't know how, and I might ask you this, actually. I don't know how you'd prove that it is the smacking that increases that probability. Because it could be that if you're from a dysfunctional background or you're from uh, uh, or, or you have neglectful parents or, or you have um, other issues other difficulties it could be that that means you are both more likely to be smacked and more likely to suffer from poor mental health or do badly at school or, or even be physically assaulted later in life or, or, or abused do you see what I mean I, I can see the correlation but I can't necessarily see the, the, the causation. Now, I know Berwick-on-Tweed is in England. I, I just said you can smack a child in Berwick-on-Tweed, Richard, but but you can't a few miles north. So if you were... Anyway, anyway. If I didn't make it clear enough, that's my fault. I take full responsibility for it. I prefer Andrew's text. Andrew says, get in the car. You're going to get a smack in a few miles' time. So that there is some silliness there, but it doesn't take away from the fact that the, that the suggestion seems sound. It's described as a complete violation of children's rights. Now, I don't know about you. It will depend slightly on your age. But, are you, I, I mean, in fact, it takes us back to that fellow in Ely a moment ago. And, and so I bridle when someone criticises my colleagues. You can say what you like about me, but you criticise my colleagues. And I'm a very different beast from how I am when you criticise me. And it's like family, isn't it? You, you can say what you want about your family. But if I criticise your family, you're going to have a bit of a beef with me. Of course you are, and vice versa. You can't criticise my family. And if I sit here now and talk about the obvious cruelty and unsuitability of smacking children, I'm criticising my family. 
I'm 52 years old. Almost everybody my age would have been smacked as a child. We did a quick test in the office, actually, and I was slightly surprised to discover that colleagues in their late 20s were more smacked than not smacked as well. I thought it had probably dissipated by then. I thought it, I, 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 would have, I would have thought, if I'd had to put a cut-up point in place, I'd have probably put 30. I said, something happened around that time, around 30 years ago, around 1994. Maybe it's New Labour. Maybe it's 97 is the cut-off point, actually. And it just, it just shifted culturally from being a perfectly normal thing to do and this is a defense of parents that did it. It, it. it was a perfectly normal thing to do. Some parents went too far, uh, and we would all these days be fairly well qualified in identifying how, how far is too far. You know, cruel and unusual punishment is, is fairly obvious. Doing it because you've lost control, people used to say, is worse than doing it more formally. But I was never sure about that, you know. I was never sure about that. So you say something, I, 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 you say something to your dad, for example, that is just outrageous, and your dad's red mist de de descends, and he gives you a smack on the bum, and somehow that's worse than the formal. I think the formal stuff's more frightening. Certainly, getting beaten at school when you have to wait outside the headmaster's study, and you hear someone else being beaten, and they come out with their hands in their armpits like that to try and sort of alleviate some of the pain. Um, and, and then you have to go in and you have to put your hands out like that and then you get to the end of the ritual, which is what it is, and you have to say, thank you, sir. That's much worse, isn't it, than someone who temporarily loses control and gives you a, gives you a clatter. At least I think it is. I always remember, I can't remember what I'd done, but I remember mum telling me that I was going to get smacked when dad got home. That was torture, man. I'd much rather mum had just had a swing at me herself and got it out of the way because waiting for dad to come home and then thinking about it, my poor old dad gets home parks the morris marina in the drive comes into the house puts his briefcase down by the uh, by the telephone table and then and then he wants well, you know what he wants he wants a gin and tonic and a small cigar that's what he wants he's had a hard day at the daily telegraph writing stories about miners and 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 car workers and the like. And he gets through the door. He's, he's thinking, I'll just have a relax. Perhaps I shall exchange some pleasantries with my charming young son, James. And he walks through the door and, and his wife says to him, oh, you've got to go upstairs and, and, and hit your son. He's going, what? I've just got in. I want a gin and tonic and a small cigar. No, sorry. You've got to go upstairs and hit your son first. That's weird, right? That's weirder than I say something rude and dad's in the room and he goes, you can't say that. Thwack. But we live in a world now where none of that is acceptable, and I prefer that world. But it took me a while to get here, and it took me a while to work out why it took me a while to get here. And the reason was I don't want to slag my dead dad off. He did nothing wrong when he hit me. And yet he did. And yet he did. The people that loved us more than anyone can ever love us also hit us. Because it was normal. Cultural change, eh? Mad, right? That absolutely no doubt whatsoever in your mind that your dad loved the bones of you. Absolutely loved the bones of you. If you're lucky enough that he's still alive, change the tense of this observation. Your dad loves you so much. In fact, you know what you could do for me today? Give him a ring and tell him how much you love him if he's still around. And and of course, if you do, some people not blessed with love in, that, in, the, in, the, in their lives or in that kind of relationship. But just take a little moment today to, to get in touch with your old man and tell him how much you love him. But he hit you. <laughs> and if you had had some sort of truth serum and you could have administered it to him, he, he would have told you that he honestly thought, he honestly thought that it was for your own good. I'm not talking about children whose treatment would have been considered abusive even when smacking was normalized, right? I, I, I feel nothing but sympathy for you, and I appreciate there's a level of violence. So even at my prep school, I would be regularly beaten formally by the headmaster, but there were, I've told you the story of the bonfire night where a teacher completely lost the plot and, and tried to kick my head in, and he got fired that night from the school. Um, it's, it's a mad story, that. I'll tell you the full version of it one day. And, and there's a difference. So there is a difference between what you would call formalized punishment or, or acceptable smacking and unacceptable abuse. 
And and if you were in the latter category, I, 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 I'm so sorry for you. I really am. And I hope you don't find this conversation triggering. And, and if you do, I'll do my best to be responsible. But for the rest of us, for the rest of us, our parents did, did wrong by us. And yet they didn't. I can't unravel that. I've tried. I've got, I've got no particular... Uh, beef with it historically it's not something that came up in therapy being beaten by teachers came and i didn't get smacked very often i I mean you know but probably not even into double figures in my entire life but it was there it was there as the punishment it was there as the ultimate sanction and my parents could not have loved me more so what i'm interested in if we can do this what I'm interested in is the, the, the damage that it does. Because I can sit here now and say to you, it didn't do me any harm. And I'm pretty sure it didn't. But I used to be, and I kid you not, I used to be adamant that being beaten by teachers at school hadn't done me any harm. I used to appear on television programs defending corporal punishment. Because it hadn't done me any harm. It was a sort of self-protection mechanism. It's, it's like a sort of suit of psychological armor. It did me loads of harm. Made me f- f- made me have very odd relationships with authority. It made me aggressive. It made me very um, very uh, 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 you know attack is the best form of defence. It made me terrified of being wrong. It made me feel shame. I, all of these things I carried throughout most of my adult life from the age of thirty, about the age of ten onwards. And I'd sit in a television studio and I'd say, if it's done formally and it's done carefully, and it's done clearly, and you know what the parameters are, and you know what you'll get beaten for, then it's actually, for some children, it's the only language they understand. And then do you know what I'd say? I'd say, and I know because I used to be one of those children. And I was so wrong. Horribly. Heinously wrong. I don't think I'm wrong about my parents. But I can't say that for sure, can I? So... What do you think then? Why is smacking children, or why does smacking children make them much more likely to suffer poor mental health, to do badly at school, to be physically assaulted or even abused? Why? What what damage does it do? Decent parents who did it back in the day. Talk me through it. Talk me through you or, or the psychology of it. 03456060973 is the number you need because most people my age probably down, down to you know mid 30s would have been smacked but then having become parents not smacked so what's what's the damage done what's the damage done 03456060973 is the number you need. It's 1118. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 19 minutes after 11, and you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I, I like this, um, and also I, I, I don't like it. Michael's been in touch to say, I can't listen, James, I have to turn off. I'm 64, and I've just started to cry as the nightmares come to the service. John in Glastonbury, just, just for balance, says, thank you, James. That, that was a really moving introduction. It made me laugh and cry um and we are going to continue with the conversation um but conscious of the reaction that michael and a few others are having and one very good point being made even if we can't pinpoint precisely the harm that it does how could it possibly do good what 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 possible good did it do who looks back and thinks oh thank god they smacked me if they hadn't smacked me i'd be in all sorts of bother the research seems to suggest that if they smacked you you are more likely to get into all sorts of bother later in life although there's a little quibble there between quibble between co- correlation and causation um paul puts it best let's suppose for a second that it doesn't do any harm what good could it possibly do does it does it force compliance through violence I, I would never act grateful for corporal punishment at school. I think, and I'm not getting my violin out or asking you to feel sorry for me, but I think if you didn't say thank you on the way out of the headmaster's study, you'd get another whack. I think that's why we all said thank you. We didn't make some sort of re- rebellious stand. So I'm not, you, you don't say thank you, he calls you back for more. So, so 
what is the damage that is done? I don't doubt it, to be clear, but I want some help articulating. I don't doubt it, but I can't describe it. Claire's in Wimbledon. Claire, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Hello. I think it just starts with a really sad thing that if you you want your children to be respectful, therefore you have to give them respect. Say, for example, if you were a person at work and you did something bad and you got pulled into the um, produce, um, your boss's office and he went, you've done this, this and this, and then cracked you across the face, you should be absolutely shocked and worried, wouldn't you? Same thing works with children. The, the way you treat them, how you wish them to grow up. Therefore, if you do this thing where you smack and degrade them it starts a cycle of events therefore i, but I think you've already positive. i think i think you've already crossed the line and this might be me speaking as a child of the 70s who who, 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 who adores his parents and whose parents adored him because i'm already feeling defensive and i'm trying to draw a really important distinction between smacking a child on the bottom or on the legs for being naughty i don't see that and i could be wrong here but i don't see that in the same universe as as punching a colleague in the face because they've annoyed me at work. Maybe I should do. Oh, no, I didn't mean, like, punching. I meant they just gave you, like, a smack. Like, you'd be, like, shocked, wouldn't you? You'd be like, ooh, what about Yeah, I but I don't see it as being the same. I don't, I don't know why. I mean, it was normal growing up for parents to physically discipline their children. It's not normal for bosses to physically discipline their staff. So it's just a question of what's normal now. I think what you have to understand is as a child, you're growing up and you are the one that are teaching them self-awareness. You are the one that is teaching them how to be. No, I, I, no, I do. I, I, no, I, I, completed. I mean, I was smacked. I right. was smacked as a child. So how did it harm um, you? Well, I, I suppose it didn't. Well, that's the point the, I'm it, making. It <laughs> You're no, here no, to I tell mean, me that it, it did. It was the actual fear of God in me. You know, it was like, yeah. it was like the joke with my, with my brother that like, if we had the choice of the police catching us or my mum and dad catching us, we'd rather the police got us before our mum and dad. So it put the actual fear of granny into us, if you know what I mean. However, I've got children and I have never smacked them. No, I know that, but I'm trying to pin down the harm that it did. And, and you, don't, you, think, you, like me, don't think it did you any harm. And yet it, I don't think it did any harm, but I can understand now, in this day and age, with so much going on where kids need that kind of, not stability, that safe net, that kind no, of... I, I, I can like as well. I, no, I can as well. Um, and, and, and the world has changed. The world, the world has turned. But we need to... I, I think we're possibly... Look, we're either both right or both wrong. And I'm interested in entertaining the possibility that it, it hasn't done as deep and lasting harm, but it, it might have done us some harm because the rationale for banning it is that it, it is bad on every level. So even if you've got this sort of 1970s hangover of not wanting to put the boot into your own parents because A, they were doing something that everybody did and B, um, they loved you. They were not abusive parents. We have to entertain the possibility that even for children like us, lasting harm was done. Neil is in Western Superman. Neil, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Hello. We've spoken before about um, social care and, and, okay. and things in the past. And um, I... I run a social care company. I deliver training on um, uh, behaviour management in children and adults. Yes. Um, and the, one of the things that we know about um, children that were smacked, I was smacked as a child, and um, I had loving parents and everything. And they, they, they just did what everyone did in the 80s and um, in, in before that. But um, what we know about children when they're um, children that are smacked is that they, it increases the cortisone levels and yeah. um, does um, increases the expectation of fear or the expectation of, of abuse from future relationships. As an and, and this is chemistry that you're describing. This yeah. isn't sociology is or, or, yeah, this is, this is no. basic chem it's, biology. It's, 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 yeah, this is actually, this is provable fact. Mm. Um, and the other thing that we, we, we should consider is whenever you ask anybody that, smack, that still condones smacking in children, you say, so what are you actually trying to achieve by smacking your child? Mm. Well, I'm trying to, you're trying to punish him and tell him that he shouldn't do that. I said, so you're trying to educate your child, but you're not educating your child because there's no link between smacking a child and actually um, what they actually did. If draw on a wall or whatever, you know, running into a road, whatever the child did, there's no link between those two. So the child's not going to understand what they did wrong. You know, so you know, we need to educate a child. So you need to stop them, tell them that you love them you know, afterwards, because it's about uh, repairing that relationship. But you, you need to actually help so, that child uh, understand uh, what uh, they should do differently. I, I, I think you're, you're, you're obviously right. How, how do you how do you spot the damage? How do you know what's 
possibly being caused by being smacked as a child. It's funny how oh. I use the word beaten when I talk about school. and sm- Well, it's not oh, funny at all because I was beaten. beaten at school. It was a very different thing. I was smacked at home occasionally, beaten at school yeah. quite quite yeah, regularly. Was. They were two very, very different things. And I find it easy to identify the lasting damage done by the beatings at school. But but how would yeah. you... A child smacked in a, in a, in a non-abusive stroke criminal way is going to suffer. What would be the signs of that, that the impact of that experience? What's interesting is that yeah. most of the people that still condone, um, that I speak to, that still condone it when I'm delivering training and things are quite often men. Um, and one of the things that you, that's quite a familiar factor in those men is, is the fact that they will want to be men that quite often don't show their emotions. Yeah. Um, uh, too, because they're told, quite often told things like, don't cry, don't be, don't be a girl. Um, uh, they're, but often they're the men that go, well, I'll, I'll just take the pain myself. Yeah. I'll just take it on myself rather than actually sharing and uh, explaining why they might be in pain and which relates to early suicide, um, you know, increased suicide rates in men. Yeah. Um, specifically, um, you know, um, and why there is a poor mental health, you know, it's all related to, um, you know, increased violence, you know, yeah. And, and also what you consider to be an acceptable way for you to be treated so subconscious yeah. subconsciously that's that's yeah. that, that i deserve it, it. Attachment. i deserve attachment. it so you, your, your expectations in relationships actually become one of um what is self-neglect or abuse yeah yeah, you know, and, so, so that would make sense. So, so it doesn't mean that everyone whose dad smacked them on the bottom for nicking a pound note out of their mum's purse to go down the arcade <laughs> with 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 you know Dale from number fifty three doesn't yeah. doesn't mean that everyone in that category carries any of the things that you describe. But in order to protect the people that do, the future people that do, we outlaw it completely. Completely. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a no, it's a no brainer. Yeah, it is. It's it's an absolute no brainer because it it it's not punishing a child; it's abusing a child. Yeah, and that's it now is. I feel defensive again because my dad didn't abuse me. No, no, because they, they didn't. It didn't intentionally, but it, there is. I mean, I, I I feel the same thing because you know I had an absolutely incredible father. He, mm. he passed away a few years ago, and same. I had an amazing relationship with him. Um, you know, and he he taught me very much about. Um, in his own way about um, how, how I should be as a person. Yeah. Um, but he didn't do that intentionally. He did That was just purely him as a person. But, you know, he, he, you know, he smacked... I didn't get smacked a lot. No, same. Uh, yeah, and I definitely pushed a lot of boundaries when I was younger. Um, See, you're coming close it, it, to saying you deserved it then, weren't you? Just yeah, subconsciously, yeah, true, because you true. love your dad. And, 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 and yeah, we're, yeah. we're complicated creatures. We're not flipping robots. Absolutely. But you didn't Absolutely. deserve it. You never deserved no. it. And I never deserved no, I d- it. Didn't. But they didn't do bad when they did it. No. Intentionally. No, absolutely. I'll take the intentionally. Yeah, I mean- and I, there, there have been times where I've I've been pushed to my levels with with our four year old son, you know, because of course. you know younger and things things get complicated. Where I've been close to, to doing it, and then it just you, you you shock yourself out of it. And that's ridiculous. That's absolutely silly, you know. And afterwards, and and then that's the important part of apologising and repairing that relationship. Yeah, 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 you know? yeah, yeah. And 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 of course, the, the the big takeaway from everything you've said is the importance of talking, articulating. Not repressing, not not holding it in. Um, I, I I don't I don't think we'll be doing it today because I've, I've framed the question very differently. But in the past, when we've taken calls from men, almost always men who were still defending their right to to hit children, that, that I think you'd let me say that there was a you could detect a certain type. I don't know that I would go much further than that, but a, a, a certain type. And that wasn't true in the 70s and 80s because it was so utterly, utterly commonplace. Half past 11 is the time. Amelia Cox is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. 11.32 is the time. PMQ's on the way, of course, um, around about 12. Natasha Clark, our political editor, joining me shortly before kickoff to, um, to, to, to run her eye over the likely... Uh, contents of PMQs, although I mean it's all up for grabs today. The, the the rebellion on the smoker, I don't know. I won't preempt it. We shall wait for Natasha. In the meantime, um, the question of why smacking must be banned everywhere, currently banned, parental smacking currently banned 
in uh, Wales and Scotland, but not banned in England and Northern Ireland. It's funny. The devolution's m- very odd. I'm turning into that character from the Fast Show. Have you noticed? I'm trying so hard not to say the word extraordinary that I'm turning into that Paul Whitehouse character who thinks everything's amazing. Like, I'm calling everything mad and bonkers. Oh, it's mad, isn't it? It's amazing. But it, devolution's bonkers, isn't it? Devolution, it's incredible. Because I mean, the things that they can do and the things that they can't do. So, I, you know, you, you, you've got UK-wide laws, regulations in various areas, but on something like smacking, you can have a complete um, difference, a complete disconnect. You, literally, a, you know, one step from uh, from Wales into England, and the law changes on smacking your own children. It's because you drive over the drive over the Seven Bridge. Would it? Would it happen there? Would you? Would you move in the course of that one expanse? That one road over the bridge, I think, is, that, is the border on the br- pretty much on the bridge? I just remember that telling my kid sister that we needed passports to get to get in and out of Wales. Yeah, we're going to Wales on holiday, we're going to Abu Dhabi on Wales. And I said, I've got my passport, have you got yours? And she got all upset. Uh, I don't think I got smacked for that. That was, that was a very low level bit of uh, bad brothering. 11.34 is the time, but we're talking about why it's necessary. And I, 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 a lot of people are ringing me and sharing stories of, of really unacceptable and gross treatment from their parents. And, and although we're not taking those calls today, I don't want you to think that I am or we are ignoring you or unsympathetic. It's just that in, in, in terms of solving this mystery as, as how does the damage manifest itself, today's conversation is about parents who were not bang out of order. So Stavros, whose dad took a belt to him, that's just disgusting and unforgivable. And even at the time, most people would have considered that wrong. But what we're talking about today is the smacking that at the time most people considered fine. That's all. So I'm sorry. It, it, it's, it's, it, it must be tough to ring in and then even tougher to realise that you're not going to get on the programme. I just want you to know that you're, you're in my thoughts. But that today's conversation is about the smacking that everyone thought was okay and the smacking that you received, the abuse that you received, was not okay. And it certainly was not your fault, but it was not okay. It's the social change with the stuff that was acceptable and how we would articulate the damage that that stuff did. Jane's in Portsmouth. Jane, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Um, I wanted to have a, a crack at answering your question about what harm did it yeah. do. Um so I'm 45. I grew up in, um, I really resonate with you describing your family as, you know, I was loved. My parents loved me. I was never in any doubt. I think I fall into that category of someone that was smacked occasionally, but I think in that kind of acceptable at the time way. Yes. Um, only sort of further on into my life did I then go through a separation from a marriage that I now realise was, was a very unpleasant marriage. And right. there was a bit of, you know, pushing and shoving that I experienced in that. And I entered therapy. And um, during the process of that therapy, I decided, I discovered that actually it had it had caused me some harm. Uh. The, the smacking that I'd thought had never caused me any harm. I'd chosen not to smack my own children and I explored the reasons around, you know, why I'd made that decision. And interestingly, I ended up having a really casual conversation with um, my sibling, my only sibling. Um, we were brought up six, you know, six years older. It was a different time for my um, my parent when we were half siblings. So yeah. my my mother was in a different situation and in a, a much uh, sort of a, a more loving relationship. And, and we were parented differently in that respect. And we had a conversation, as siblings do, about, you know, it's funny how we, we tend to parent differently, isn't it? We make different decisions yes, about our own kids, you know, to how other generations have done. And, and I said, you know, for instance, I was smacked as a child now and then to, to be disciplined. And I've chosen not to do that with my children. And my sister... Um, said oh I wasn't smacked and you know the conversation went along along mm. those lines I swear it was different times and you know and and the conversation ended fast forward 18 months I'm now completely estranged from my mum my stepdad and my sister because the fallout of that was that my my sister shared that conversation with my parents and the engine that moved into motion was complete and utter denial about the way I was parented, right. even though uh, it was a, a very casual conversation of small statement of fact, but the the ability to acknowledge and um, discuss and talk about and, you know, explore was absolutely shut down um, to the point where I was told, 
we've checked with other members of our family and they've all confirmed that you were never smacked either. Gosh. Your memories are wrong. Um, and I come from a very, very loving, close, nurturing family. I have very happy memories of my childhood. And yet Good. I'm in a situation now where the bond between my parent and I is completely gone because of a lack of a we, we, desire to discuss it. That's, that's, and and uh, that, so was it, were you raised by your stepfather? Yeah, yeah. And you were, and it was it, and it was him who who smacked you. No, no, it was actually my mother. It was your mum who smacked you. Very occasional. Yeah, and it was the sort of stuff that you described. And and you weren't offering it up as a poor me or a or a or or, and yet you're. No, it was a you know we do things differently, don't we? Isn't it interesting? And actually, to answer your question, what harm did it do? I've always, I've always like you, didn't do me any harm. I'm all right. And through therapy, I I think I realised actually, and through this experience of becoming estranged because I've wanted to talk about things that people are finding difficult to hear um i think i've realized that the harm it's done is that i don't have enough of a bond with that parent to be able to weather difficult discussions like this and i i think that is the harm i wonder why because i mean that's unlucky on one level because there's plenty of people listening from our generation who do have that relationship with their parents and sure. and were also smacked in the way that you were so uh, the, the, sure. it's, it's it's not um it's not an objective algorithm is it it's, no, it's, it's we're humans no. and we're complicated and and and, yeah. and and that's also tough on you that's almost gaslighting isn't it to, to to be told that this thing you know happened didn't happen yeah and it's a bit of a shocker to realize that actually the bonds that you have potentially looking at the research I, you know I'm a, I'm a healthcare professional and I work with families that at the very start of their lives with their babies and right. you know it's very interesting to me to look at the research and the evidence that talks to us about the damage to bonds and yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's all there. It's all in front of us. And yet I'd never even contemplated that it had caused any harm. I only mentioned it as a kind of, oh, look, it's a difference that I've, I've, I've chosen, you know, I've chosen to do something different with my children. And yet here and yeah, I there am was something the deeper than that. There Absolutely. was something deeper than that. I, yeah. I, I mean, the, the, your, your, your experience is not common, obviously, with the with the with the denial from your mum and your stepfather. But but the but the knowledge that something had obviously gone a little deeper than you acknowledged or wanted to acknowledge that that will be shared by an awful lot of people um if if any of this is affecting you and you want to talk to somebody then um napac is is a wonderful organization uh the national association for people abused in childhood you 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 can look them up on online um or, or give them a ring on 0808 801 0331 um various ways to get in touch and they're they're not like the Samaritans. They're not they're not twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. They're closed at weekends and stuff like that. But on a on a normal weekday, they're open ten till nine, um, ten a.m. to nine p.m. and they finish at six p.m. on Friday. So just 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 a quick heads up there for people who are being a bit triggered. Um, Dan, a very mild example of that. I don't think triggered would be quite the right word, but he's been in touch to say this caller is really making me realise how this may have affected me far more than I ever appreciated. I loved both my parents, barely got smacked at all, but we would never consider hitting our four-year-old daughter as a punishment, and I feel terribly guilty if I ever even find myself coming close. I too thought I was a little sod as a kid and deserved it. And, And it we are talk about me now we are almost the same age that idea that you deserved it that's it isn't it we got there so even if you're fine and you're not carrying any obvious baggage as a consequence of what was acceptable smacking the fact that you would have thought you deserved it that may be something that you've that, that has that, that has harmed you moving forward not not for the first time um emma provides a really powerful counterpoint to that saying it's normal but not right smacking at home is on the continuum you can't trust your parents the the, the consequence of it is that you can't trust your parents to not hurt you possibly even based on broken rules that you didn't even know were rules I can remember every time I was smacked at home, sometimes right across the face, I can still feel the impotent rage it invoked in me, the sense of injustice and powerlessness. I only need to close my eyes and think for a second I can conjure it up again. That poisonous emotion is still in my body 30 years later. It resides in me solely because my beloved parents, and that beloved is straight, it's not 
Saki or anything. My beloved parents induced it in me. And that is not what parents are supposed to instill in their kids. And they go on. So perhaps passing on that rage is how smacking perpetuates itself generationally. You put that impotent rage in someone small and it becomes an instinct to lash out when you become big, when induced in an adult. Uh, Keith is in Wilsdon Green. Keith, what made you pick up the phone? Um, morning, James. Hello, you well. Um, for me, I think this resonates a lot as I grew up going yeah. into uh, adult relationships. I basically found that I had no conflict resolu- uh, re- resolution skills whatsoever. Um, I would always immediately go in aggressive and not give the other person an opportunity to use their voice. Mm. And <clears throat> it caused a lot of issues. Like I've been married for five years, but with my partner for 12 years now. And early in our relationship, it caused a lot of issues. I was never physical, but just the willingness to react in an aggressive way. I never really understood where it came from. And it was only through getting a course of therapy that actually I'd seen quite a few therapists throughout my life, but okay. this guy really unlocked me. And he basically said that I was never taught to discuss things. It was always a punishment if there was some sort of disagreement. Yeah. And I I think I grew up as one of the people thinking, oh, it's okay to smack your kids. You know, it's, it's not a big issue. And it was a disagreement I actually had with my wife early in our relationship. And the interesting thing is she came from a home where that was never a thing. And I guess it's the old hurt people, hurt people sort of. How, how, did, the, how did the therapist draw the line? How, well, of course, you did the work. So how did you draw the line back to that? Because it, it, it you know, could have ended up perhaps in that, in that fight or flight mode, in that living your life. I've always described it as living your life with your metaphorical fists up. So you're not capable of conflict resolution because you're too busy trying to make sure that you close the conversation down, close the argument down, remove any possibility of shame or embarrassment by humiliating or or defeating rhetorically the other person. How did you trace it back to being smacked? How did you draw the line? Um, There was one particular sort of, not event, it was sort of like a weekly event. I was in primary school at the time. And I had a teacher that literally hated me. They taught my brother, who was two years older than me. Um, But I went into their class, and there was just a bad relationship from the beginning. And it became a thing where every week my parents would sort of go and see them at the end of the school week, have a chat with her, and she would tell them so many things that I hadn't done and paint me out to be an awful sort of child. And when we got home, there was never any opportunity for my parents or my parents never gave me the opportunity to explain and say well no this that's not true that's not the true series of events it was just straight to uh, sort of getting a whack so that's and then, rage isn't it so you you're, yeah. you're, you're buried you knew you didn't deserve it yeah you knew you didn't deserve it and that festers inside you yeah and I'm, the frustrating thing is now um i'm 36 you know i spoke to my parents about um, that particular teacher yeah. the years ago and I can remember my mum saying oh yeah she never liked you oh. she never liked you and I was just thinking oh come on you're, you're supposed to a- look after me yeah yeah there was nobody sort of fighting my corner in that way but it meant that as I grew older I just thought right and it was only interesting it was only in close relationships I'd never be like it to Joe Bloggs out on the street because sure. I never witnessed my parents being like it to Joe Bloggs out on the street. It was only at home with yeah. me and my brother and it just seemed to be, okay, well, this is how we communicate our frustration with each other. This is, instead of using words, and there was never never an explanation afterwards. There was, there was never a sit down like, this is why that happened. This is why we were disappointed, upset, why, you know, here is where we feel you could have improved your behaviour or anything. It was almost like whack done fascinating i mean your age is fascinating as well because you're right on the cusp i would say between the generations for whom it was completely normal and the generations for whom it's completely unacceptable you know yeah. at 36 you're, you're, you're almost smack in the middle of it and i presume doing the work it's you now that looks after little keith it's big keith that, that, that puts the metaphorical arm around him and tells him that he's safe now yeah absolutely that and it's sort of <laughs> 
<laughs> Gets me every time, that. Every single time. Since I had it in therapy, I must have mentioned it on the radio a dozen times. Every yeah. single time it gets me right in the field. Yeah, and I, I think you look to your parents as protectors and yeah. they're the people that when an outside person sort of comes on the attack to you or you feel like you've been mistreated, you would assume they would be the ones to stand up and say, hold on a minute. But, you know, in those moments, it felt the opposite. It felt like they'd switched switched sides. And, yeah, I think it just made me grow up with a very, my therapist always said, spikes out That's armor. It. I That's was it. always spikes very out. spikes out. Um, but uh. I would only ever put that armor on when I was in my own home because those are the relationships that I witnessed being aggressive and where when people were frustrated Got it. that's how you took it out on them and well that, that, always... yeah but that's really interesting because my i took my spikes to work I, I, I mean anyone who listened to this program 20 years ago will tell you that and i still sometimes none of us are perfect still sometimes they pop out as well but that's because it was school it was a it was a public place for me where this stuff happened the smacking at home didn't really register in that way and oddly listening to you i my mum and dad sided with me against the teachers when things got really bad which, looking back, was a was a was a mad that was a was a very rare thing to do at the time because you would at that in that era you, you would you would almost act as one. Um, Keith, I love that, right? And 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 I'm I'm so glad you've 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 done the work. I'm so glad you've got to that space. Anyone who hasn't had therapy and is sort of listening to this, thinking, I didn't realise it's a sort of you know things that blokes do or or, or, or that kind of thing. The, the 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 single most important moment in these conversations that you have with a therapist is the moment when you realise that you, as an adult, can look after that child because that child's still alive. I mean, this isn't exactly rocket science. That child is still alive. <laughs> that child is you, but the child is still inside you somewhere, and the child is still not being looked after. The child is still spikes out ready for a fight and 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 you can change it you can change it by looking after the child big you can look after little you regardless of what it was that traumatized you or, or did the damage that was done it can be undone and it, it when it happens when it works it is it's almost magical okay take care it's 10 to 12 james o'brien on lbc it is 11.53 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC where we continue to, to, to contemplate the uh, impacts often unseen, unacknowledged and, and don't want to acknowledge of being smacked as a child because the call today from the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health is for England and Northern Ireland to catch up, if you like, with Scotland and Wales and outlaw it completely. And what's not to like? I, a little nod back to the first hour um, because the, I mean, the ruling is going to be very hard to implement. What we once considered acceptable, that sort of smacking, how, how are you going to prosecute it? But equally, how are you going to stop a 46-year-old 20 years, 30 years hence from asking a 47-year-old to buy them 20, 20 Marlboro Lights? So it doesn't have to be, um, I don't know, watertight legislatively to be uh, b desirable socially or, or, or politically. 11.54 is the time. That, that organisation that I mentioned earlier, a few of you are asking about um, supporting recovery from childhood abuse is, is the job of NAPAC, N-A-P-A-C, the National Association for People Abused in Childhood and, and the number 0808 801 0331. But if you just Google NAPAC, N-A-P-A-C, you'll find everything that you need to find. Uh, 11.55 is the time. PMQ's on the way. Time for one or two more calls before that. Lara is in Nottingham. Lara, what would you like to say? Hi, good morning, Hello. James. Um, I was uh, smacked as a kid. I mean, I was a nightmare of a child, I have to say. Oh, you, you, did, nightmare. Did, did you see straight away? Yes, I, yes just hear me out. I am hear hearing you out. I am hearing okay, you out. I and you. I have no doubt in my mind that my mum loved me. It was my mum. My right. dad never, ever, you know, laid a finger on us. He just gave us the look and that's it. I mm. would die in shame, of shame. But my mum was very, uh, very much, yeah. Um, not to the extent that it would harm us physically, you know, no bruises or anything of the sort. Yes. But it was repeatedly done. Um, and then, like I said, I mean, I never doubted her love to me. I still don't doubt her love to me. And I wouldn't class it as abuse either. Okay. However... Uh, fast forward 20 years later, I'm in a relationship in my marriage and I 
was physically abused and that I would call abuse. And mm. in my mind, I thought, yes, well, I deserved it because I was naughty. I was bad. No. Um, and it went on and on and on for about nine years. Um, and in a way, I never saw the link, but being hit as a kid or being smacked as a kid and then being told that I love you. Yeah made it okay for me to accept his I love you? I'm so sorry. I, 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 <laughs> I, I'm so sorry for what you've been through, but I, the clarity of what you've just explained is stunning. Absolutely stunning. But again, I cannot say my mother abused me. No, of I course. I don't want it. you to. But i tell you what and I do want you to say. I want you to say that you were a lovely child and that you didn't deserve to be here. I, I don't know. <laughs> yes, you were. You were absolutely <laughs> lovely. <laughs> I had character. No, you were say. lovely. You, we were both lovely. We were both but lovely children. And it, n- neither of us ever deserved... <laughs> so, so, but, but there it is. I, I wasn't able to confront him. I mm. wasn't able to say, this is wrong. What you're doing to me is wrong. Um, and I've accepted it back then. Yeah. Um, and I don't know. I mean, I did work on myself and I did go to therapy. And if anything, now I'm a bit more confrontational. And if something is not right, I would stand up and say it. It would be it for me, for sure. anybody around me, even a stranger on the street. I would stand and fight for them uh, if I find that, that, you know, there's something wrong. Yes. Um, but it, yeah. But it, that, 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 the, the parameters of what is acceptable were drawn long before you met your abusive husband. Yes. I think. Yes. As long as you say, I love you, and you give me a hug at the end. Then and everything, because your mum did. It's and, okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, God, Laura, thank you. Uh, uh, you've taken us right up to the end of this conversation in, the, in a really powerful way, and I'm so glad that you're in a much better place now. And I'm so glad that you told me off for interrupting you earlier, otherwise we wouldn't have got there in the time available. <laughs> so it's, it's all there, all covered. 11.58 is the time. It is that time of... How many have we had? Two, two weeks off, Natasha Clark? I think it's been three. Three weeks off. From PMQs, they will pick up, I presume, where they left off. What, squabbling like teenagers? Yes. Yes, I'm sure they will. Um, sure, we can play bingo. Is it going to be back to square one? Who's going to mention Liz Truss first? Uh, yeah, all of the usual, uh, I'm sure, phrases will come out of the woodwork again. Um, I agreed with what you said earlier, that I think he will go on smoking. I mean, you needed us to get your big idea over the line, sort Sorry. of thing. Oh, as in, yeah, yeah, of yeah. course. But also it, it gives Keir Starmer the argument to talk about how the Tories are such a divided party and he loves talking about that. So I imagine that might be one, especially if Kemi Badenoch, I can't see her at the moment whether she is sitting on the front bench, but it might be It was be a free to vote, out. to be clear. Of course it was, but it was, you know, a mess it's of... still it's embarrassing. A mess, it's a mess of their own making. They didn't mm. need to make it a free vote. Um, and he knew that it would have um, exposed the divisions in his own party by allowing MPs to vote however they liked. Uh, and you've even got Kemi Badenoch that feels so strongly against it that she actually voted against the whole thing. Um, Penny Morden, I can see she's on the front bench. She abstained on it. And she, again, is seen by many as a potential Tory leadership candidate. And lots of these people thinking, well, actually, we need to be on the on the right side of the grassroots Conservatives, uh, ready for when that comes. It's a crucial point because it is the only caucus identified by pollsters as being broadly opposed to this legislation is Conservative members, mm-hmm. not voters. Mm-hmm. Not Conser- voters, yeah. Conservative voters are warmer towards it than Labour voters. Only by oh, a t- two-point so? difference. Yeah, two, 62% of Conservative voters like like it, 60% of Labour voters like it, but Conservative members, a majority, mm. don't like it. So they're all watching that particular ball, aren't they? Yeah, definitely. Um, it is generally really, obviously, we've had lots of callers on both sides of the equation that have been calling into the station about this. But generally, I think from the minute it was announced at Tory conference, there was a lot of, of, of warm words for this policy. I and mean, like you say, all the polls do suggest that people do like it. I think the question mm-hmm. that many Tory MPs, they were asking is it really going to make you vote for the Conservatives at the upcoming election? Uh, and as one person no. put it to me yesterday, <laughs> there's nothing the Tories can, uh, can 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 offer to me that's going to make me vote for them at the next election. But I don't think that banning smoking is going to be something that will get them over the line. Unlikely. Um, is any of the Suella Braverman's association with this strange ragtag of, of, of right-wing weirdos who, who, for the record, should still be able to exercise freedom of speech whether they're in brussels bolton or birmingham but a bit odd for a for a conservative mp to be on a platform with some distinctly strange opinions will he bring that up starmer 
Well, um, Starmer may do, um, but you know, Rishi Sunak, I think, will will come out in favour of free speech on this. His spokesperson yesterday said that he was worried about what happened in Brussels and the appear what appeared to be the case that um, that they had uh, had blocked this meeting from taking place. Indeed, that tweet uh, from the foreign minister of Brussels said, "We don't welcome the far right in Brussels," and I think it's turned into a political issue, political football. Um, and arguably the, the Brussels foreign minister and the mayor has walked right into that trap of, of essentially cancelling this gathering, giving them even more fuel to their fire. So I, maybe they I, will raise that. Yeah, the one thing you shouldn't do with desperate attention seekers is exactly. give the attention that Throw they seek. Throw them some more petrol on that fire. Here's Keir Starmer. Uh, can I too welcome the postmasters in the gallery in their quest for justice? And um, Mr Speaker, this week we marked 35 years since the disaster at Hillsborough and the enduring courage and determination of the families must be marked by the passing of a Hillsborough law. (coughs) Mr Speaker, we also lost Lord Richard Rosser, a lifelong member of the Labour Party. He will be greatly missed and our thoughts are with his wife Sheena, his family and friends. Mr Speaker, I'm privileged to be the proud owner of a copy of the former Prime Minister's new book. It's a rare, unsigned copy. It's quite the, it's the only unsigned copy. It's quite the read. She claims the Tory party's disastrous kamikaze budget that triggered chaos for millions was, her words, the happiest moment of her premiership. Has the Prime Minister met anyone with a mortgage who agrees? <laughs> well, Mr Speaker, all I'd say is he uh, ought to spend a bit less time reading that book and a, bit, and, a bit more, and a bit more time reading the Deputy Leader's tax advice. Here's Starmer. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. We've got a billionaire Prime Minister and a billionaire Prime Minister, both of, both of whose families have used schemes to avoid millions of pounds of tax, smearing a working class woman. And I know. And the Prime Minister. The former Prime Minister has a long list of people to blame for the economic misery. They don't want to hear it. They made her Prime Minister. And millions of people are paying the price. She's got a long list of people to blame. She blames the Governor of the Bank of England, the Treasury, the Office for Budget Responsibility. The American President is blamed at one point. We even learned that the poor old lettuce was part of the deep state. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that it's actually much simpler than that? It was the Tories' unfunded tax cuts, yeah. tens of billions of pounds of unfunded tax cut, that crashed the economy and left millions paying more on their mortgages, yeah. wasn't it? Mr. Mr Speaker, everyone knows that two years ago I wasn't afraid to repeatedly warn about what her economic policies would lead to, even if it wasn't what people wanted to hear at the time. Mr Speaker, I was right right then, but I'm also right now when I say that his economic policies would be a disaster for Britain. He would send inflation up, mortgages up and taxes up, and working people would pay the price. I appreciate the Prime Minister having the stomach to say it out loud, but everyone knows it's the Tory party's obsession with wild, unfunded tax cuts that crashed the economy. We know it, he knows it, they know it, and the whole country is living it. So when is he finally going to learn the lesson from his predecessor's mistakes and explain where the money is coming from for his own completely unfunded £46 billion promise to scrap national insurance? 
Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, when when my predecessor was running for leader, to use his words, I did have the stomach to argue out loud about her economic policies. Had the conviction to say that they were wrong, but not once, but twice, he tried to make his predecessor prime minister. Despite him opposing NATO and Trident, ignoring anti Semitism and siding with our enemies. It's clear what he did. He put his own interests ahead of Britain's. Uh, I think actually, when he was running for Prime Minister, uh, for leader, he, he was explaining how he's funneling money from poor areas to pay it into richer areas. We know what his record is. I, I, I notice he's not denying the £46 billion promise to scrap the national insurance, but is refusing to say where the money will come from. And we've been trying for months to get to the bottom of this. So now's his chance. No more spin, no more waffle, no more diversion. I know that will be difficult. He can either, Mr Speaker, this is the choice, he can either cut state pension or the NHS that national insurance funds, that's route one, or he can put up income tax. Which one is it? Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we've just cut taxes by £900 for a typical worker. We've delivered the biggest tax cut for businesses since the 1980s. But while we're cutting taxes, Labour is already putting them up. In Wales, putting up taxes right now for small businesses. In Birmingham, putting up council tax by 21%. In London, in London, his mayor has put up taxes by 70%, Mr. Speaker. And this is just a glimpse of what they'd do if they got in power. A few weeks ago, he finally admitted it to the Sun. What would he say he would do? I quote, he said, we would put up taxes. It's always the same, Mr. Speaker. Higher taxes and working people paying the price. No single politician has ever put tax up more times than he has. But, but, but Mr Speaker, uh, just hang on, because he was given the chance, he was, no, he was just given the chance to rule out cutting the NHS or state pun- pensions to pay for scrapping this issue. No, he's, I, I was a lawyer long enough to know when someone's avoiding the question. So I, I'm going to give him another chance. Will he now rule out, cuts the NHS, cuts the state pension, or putting up taxes to pay for his unfunded £46 billion promise to scrap national insurance? Which is it? Mr Speaker, I make absolutely no apology about wanting to end the unfairness of the double taxation on work, Mr Speaker. The NHS is receiving record funding under this Conservative Government. Pensioners have just received a £900 increase under this Government. But if he wants to talk about tax, let's have a look at what Labour's brand newly appointed tax adviser has to say. This adviser this advisor thinks that supporting pensioners is a complete disgrace, Mr Speaker. He believes their free TV licences are ridiculous. And if it wasn't bad enough, this adviser has called for increases in income tax, in national insurance and VAT. Now, it all makes sense now. That's who the Shadow Chancellor has been copying and pasting from. So... So, so this is genuinely extraordinary. Two chances, two chances to rule out, Mr. Speaker. Two chances to rule out cuts to state pension, cuts to the NHS, or income tax rises to fund his promise to abolish national insurance. Order, order, order. Mr. Holden, I want you to set a good example, not a bad one. Keep stop. Mr Speaker, this really matters. He's had two chances to rule out these cuts. Cuts to NHS, cuts to uh, tax or or pensions or tax rates. This matters to millions of people watching who want to know what's going to happen to the NHS and pensions. Uh, It really does matter to millions of people who are watching. So I'll be really generous now and give him one last chance. Very simple, very clear. Is his £46 billion promise to abolish national insurance being paid for by cuts to the NHS, cuts to the state pension, or yet another Tory tax rise. Mr Speaker, he's really got to keep up, Mr Speaker. 
it's, it's, this, it's this government that's just delivered a £900 increase to the state pension. It's this government that's already committed to the triple lock for the next parliament. Uh, he, he had six opportunities. I didn't think I heard him say that, Mr Speaker. And when it comes to the NHS, you'd much rather be treated in Conservative-run NHS in England, not the Labour-run NHS in Wales, Mr Speaker. But it's another week where all we heard is political sniping, Mr Speaker, not a word about their plans for the country. He's failed to acknowledge that since we last met, taxes have been cut by £900, state pensions have gone up, free childcare has been expanded, wages have risen for nine months in a row, Mr Speaker, and just today, inflation down again to 3.2%. Our plan is working and the Conservatives are delivering a brighter future for Britain. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, you will not be surprised to learn that I am very much welcome the £20 million allocated to Colton in my Gedling constituency as part of the long-term plan for tight towns. But I am very eager to see that this money is spent according to local wishes. I know there will be consultations following the setting up of the Towns Board. So Will my right honourable friend join me in urging Colton residents to take part in those forthcoming consultations to make sure their voices are heard and to ensure that this money is spent where the people want? Can I thank my honourable friend for his tireless campaigning on behalf of the residents of Carlton? Our long term plan for towns means that 75 towns across the country, including Carlton, will benefit from £20 million each to invest in their local area. But crucially, as he said, that will be in the hands of local people deciding on their priorities for the place that we live, whether it's regenerating local high streets, investing in parks and green spaces, or tackling antisocial behaviour. We're levelling up across the country, and he deserves enormous praise for his role in securing that investment. SNP leader Stephen Flint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This week, a former Prime Minister who oversaw a financial crash before being unceremoniously tuffed from office told the public the truth, and I'm not referring to that one, Mr Speaker, <laughs> because on Monday, Gordon Brown told the people of these aisles that the forces pulling Britain apart are greater than the forces holding it together. So maybe the Prime Minister can find some time this afternoon to perhaps agree with just one of his predecessors. Well, Mr Speaker, where I do agree with my predecessor very strongly is that Scotland would be far stronger inside the United Kingdom. Mr Speaker, of course, where Gordon Brown was also correct was in stating that Scottish independence is not simply off the agenda. And indeed, those remarks were echoed just yesterday by the General Secretary of the Scottish Trade Union Congress, who stated that it remains an unresolved issue, Mr Speaker, before going on to state, and I confirm, and they may laugh at her, but she said, that can be a very dangerous place to end up in when you are not allowing people to express their wishes in a democratic manner. So may I ask... So may I ask the... So may I ask the Prime Minister, does he welcome the fulsome, wholehearted and warm support of the Labour Party in denying the people of Scotland that opportunity to have a say over their own future? Well, Mr Speaker, we did have a democratic vote on that topic. Uh, But what I would suggest to the SNP is that rather than obsessing about independence and indeed wasting time cracking down on free speech and trying to lock up JK Rowling, he should focus on what the people of Scotland actually care about. Schools, hospitals, jobs and our new tax cuts. Name Andrea Jenkins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I abhor a two-tier policing system and we must ensure that everyone is treated equally under the rule of law. The Labour Police and Crime Commissioner who investigated the Beagate scandal handed their police chief constable a new three-year contract whilst the investigation... Quarter past 12 is the time. I I, I don't think there's anybody in the world currently thinking, oh, I'd like to hear what Andrea Jenkins has to say. So, working on that premise. James O'Brien on LBC. 16 is the time. Some random texts um, before we... 
uh, pick over the bones of what you have just heard. Tony says, Lindsay Hoyle seems to have given up his current role as Speaker. Andrew says, Stephen Flynn, brilliant again. Di says, why is Sunak so incapable of answering a question? Caroline asks a question I see every week, you know. Why does PMQs have to be like this, James? Why can't they just talk to each other in a normal way rather than continually sneery tone with all the weird jeering noises in the background? I think that was Jonathan Gullis, actually, the, the, the weird jeering noises in the background. Uh, Chris points out, Sai, he writes, PMQs and Sunak pressed the Corbyn button again. Tony says, what is Starmer playing at with these questions? He's making Sunak sound competent. Colin says, what an absolute waste of time that was. Just call an election already. And James says, since when did Keir Starmer become a comedian? That was cracking. As was a, a joke about give her one of my speeches in a children's hospital show and have I got news for you? You've met him, James. Has he had lessons or is this just him? Something you've picked up on in, in the relatively recent past, Natasha Clark. Yes, yeah, we've talked K- about this before, haven't we, James? Keir Starmer has discovered his funny bones. He is. They were... I- I, I enjoyed both the opening remarks mm. from uh, from him. Has he read? Has he read it? I've got the only unsigned copy. <laughs> Lovely. A bit close to home, that actually. Yeah. That's a joke. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Is there any copies of no, your book that are unsigned? Not unsigned. Do they exist? Not unsigned. No, not I'll, yet. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll pay you a tenner if I can find one of those uh, in any bookshops. Um, but yes, and uh, I actually, to be fair, so also thought that um, the Rishi Sunak's retort. Uh, obviously fired up the Tory benches but also was quite funny as he spent a bit more time reading the deputy leader's tax advice I thought that was quite funny Mm. again it's clear after a couple of weeks off that everybody is a bit more fired up I think we were a bit flat at the end of last term weren't we and everybody really needed a break and now both of them I think have have had their Weetabix again but yes Keir Starmer is absolutely enjoying being uh, being leader of the opposition and doing these Prime Minister's questions even more Uh, and you can sort of see it and you hear it with the media interviews that many of them do from the front bench they are very much, I think, expecting to win the next election now. There is obviously a risk that some of them do get a little bit uh, arrogant about the whole thing. But I think that generally it comes across with Keir as more confident and I think a, a bit more statesman-like, but equally also a little bit more humanity. And Keir Starmer, I think, struggles to show that humanity sometimes. And when mm. he is making some of these funny jokes, it is a little bit uh, more of his human side. So I think it does work in this kind of setting. Um, and... And yet there wasn't much there. Did, did that work, that attempt to pin down, to make him make a pledge? That's a pre-election ploy. He's quite good at this, but it doesn't work well in the moment. We saw him setting a trap for Boris Johnson, which Boris Johnson ended up essentially being um, enmeshed in, although it wasn't technically what did for him in the end, the, 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 the claims about parties at Downing Street and the rest of it. This is attempting to triangulate Sunak into a position where his election pledges would contradict something that Starmer Starmer had got him to say in Parliament about where Mm. the money was going to come from, I think, or something like that. Yes, so he was trying to get him to say this. So Rishi Sunak has repeatedly said he wants to abolish national insurance completely. The Conservatives have not said where the money to pay for that is going to come from. Labour have rightly jumped on this issue because that's something that the Conservatives love to attack them about. It's one for them to, to poke a hole in. But the but yes, Rishi Sunak hasn't said what he'll do to fund it. He said it's a long-term ambition, but it is going to cost a lot of money if he's going to do it, £46 billion. Um, and yes, yeah, so that was Keir Starmer trying to say, would you like to cut the NHS to pay for it? Would you like to cut pensions to pay yeah. for it? Or would you like to put taxes? Because it will have to, to come from it. somewhere. It's going to have to come from somewhere, of And course. it will have to be one of those three things. It doesn't have to be could be anything probably though i mean if you're looking at the I mean, kind if you're of looking at the figures kind of money, involved yes but he has said he wants to do it over a long time and i imagine they won't need the money immediately to do so and it will be something that they can do over a long period of time they're obviously cutting it by just a percentage point each time so it doesn't take too much yeah, to do so maybe. however i think that it does resonate with voters as well you've said you want to cut national insurance and how are you going to pay for it that's a lot you know you get that a lot during election campaigns especially when parties make unfunded promises keir starmer's labor party are not going to make that mistake again they did it obviously with uh, the last Labour um, manifesto had a lot of spending pledges where they did not say the, how they were going to pay for it and they got into a right muddle under Jeremy Corbyn about that and I don't think that Keir Starmer wants to make that mistake again. We know that Labour want to fight on the issue of being credible on the economy but yes, I don't think this trap to try and get Rishi Sunak to say where he is going to cut is going to work but come when the manifesto does launch, he's absolutely right. If they do put it in their manifesto launch in any way saying we are going mm. to eventually abolish national insurance they've absolutely got to say how they're going to do it or Labour will rightly kick them for it. I think it was, I, I, I've been reminded of this by a text that the um, John Smith kept a copy of the 1992 Tory manifesto and you kind of use it to hold the 
government hostage from the from the position of opposition. It's not quite the same tactic because um, I don't think Starmer's expecting to lose the election, but it's a sort of preemptive manifesto undermining, isn't it? Yeah. I tell you what's interesting, quite a few people picking up on uh, the more desperate Sunak is, the quicker he reaches for Jeremy Corbyn. I don't think that's a hard and fast rule, but it's got... Mm. Some, they're both going into the... Um, general election i think successfully detaching themselves from their immediate predecessors sunak isn't really going to be held to account for much that mm. uh liz trust did and despite the best efforts of the tories today it was it was it was trident and um and nato the tri commitment to trident was in the 2019 manifesto uh, sunak's really not fooling anyone except perhaps his own backbenchers starmer's not really going to be successfully allied with Jeremy Corbyn, not least because he's slung him out of the Parliamentary Labour Party, but, yeah, but these, still they try. Yeah, these attacks, we could say we see them on both sides, yes, don't exactly. we? We see both the Tories trying to attack Labour for Jeremy Corbyn and Labour trying to attack the Tories for Liz Truss. But, and I think that is one of the um, considerations that the Prime Minister, I'm told, is thinking about when he's thinking about whether to call an election. I was told by someone the other week that, yes, the longer we leave it, the more we can distance ourselves from Liz Truss and what mm. happened. And I think that is a consideration. Also, so if he does go long... the madder she gets... I would suggest. Mm. I, I mean, the more bonkers some of her pronouncements become, then the more distance. Because Sunak, for his faults, doesn't it doesn't come across as crackers. No, he doesn't. And he, you know, he did say today, and he came out with lines which I don't think he's used for a while, saying that during the Tory leadership contest, he rightly, you know, said that she would crash the economy, that we couldn't cut all these taxes in one go, just like she wanted to do. And he said, I was right then and I'm right now. Um, so, you know, I think he does, to be fair, have a fairly good argument on this. He said at the time he wasn't going to do it. He said he was going to be responsible on the economy. He said Liz Truss was going to be a disaster and she absolutely proved to be. So he is banged to rights on that. And I don't think that um, the, the Labour argument that Liz Truss is, is very much still a part of thinking in government is not quite going to wash. It's mad though, isn't it? Because I can't, I've got to stop saying that. It's a, I've, so, so I've, I've managed to get extraordinary out of my vocabulary this week and I'm just describing everything as mad instead. But the people behind Sunak cheering were the people that essentially greased Liz Truss's passage to the leadership of the party. True. Even yeah. though he was the one saying... I know it went to the members... Didn't it yeah. go to? The, it did go to the members. It's so hard to Rishi remember. Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss Trust went to yeah. the members, but yeah. Rishi Sunak round two. No, I know that didn't go yeah, to the members. Did not. But but who got the who 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 won among the MPs? Did Sunak beat Truss or did Truss beat Sunak? Can you remember? Gosh, that's a good. Did they, question. Did they vote? Did the, it, or did the MPs just Truss. have one vote each in the overall? But anyway, he was saying yeah. that, that to the people who ended up voting for Liz Truss, this is all going to be insane. And mm -hmm. now when he stands up and says, "Well, I said it was all going to be insane," yep. all of the people behind him who voted yes, for her well, half, are all whooping and cheering. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> oh, it's crazy. Um, we don't talk about Stephen Flynn enough during this part of the of the week. It's entirely my fault. We should. Uh, we should. Uh, he's a very effective parliamentarian, um, and it, he highlights. I think on a weekly basis more effectively than his predecessor did he highlights the some of the grievances I think of, of, of Scottish nationalist SNP supporters Rishi Sunak today probably didn't even notice that he essentially told the Scottish people what they want mm. um, in in contradiction to the contribution of, of the man whose party governs Scotland. It's, it was quite strange. Chick points this out. If Sunak, if Sunak seems to know what the Scottish people want, why doesn't he let us answer for ourselves? Well, that's a good point. But I don't think anybody would argue that, that the Scottish people don't care about schools, hospitals, jobs and taxes as well, of course. And, you know, there is, there is an argument that, you know... <sighs> ironically, the SNP are in the same boat as the Conservatives. They've been in power for so long and a lot of people are, you know, sadly fed up with the way things are going in Scotland. And I imagine that the SNP won't do quite as well at this election as they did at the last, not least because of Nicola Sturgeon and the uh, fallout over, over what happened with her uh, last week. But yes, um, look, I, I'm, I'm very much not a proponent for a, a second referendum. I really, I, I do ag agree with that argument that, we, that we've had a vote. It's time to time to move on. Same with uh, same with Brexit. Uh, <laughs> my, my penance. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry I, I, to say I, the B word. So nothing, uh, I, I, nothing really landing there. 
to that. Do you not think with, it was a bit of a... No, and he gave a very short one, you know, one sentence answer saying, absolutely, we've had a, we've already had a vote. It's, you know, it's it's not one for us. Um, I don't but actually, nothing really landing for Starmer either or, or Sooner. I mean, I it, was, it was all a score really draw all round, wasn't it? Or a no really score stuck. draw. Yeah, a no I'll, score draw. I'm going to give it nil-nil. I don't think, well, apart from the two, I'll give one point to each for both of those funny jokes at the at the start, but that's, uh, that's about all the points I'm going to give, though. I don't think that Keir Starmer was successful in drawing him into a, a trap anywhere, but either did I think, you know, the, the, the things that Rishi Sunak wanted to highlight, you know, taxes, um, inflation's down, he's just handed pensioners a nice pay rise. Well, is it moving the polls, Prime Minister? Of course it's not. No, nothing is. <laughs> so no, absolutely nothing is. They're throwing the kitchen sink at absolutely everything. And missing. And just, and yeah, it's not working. I mean, you speak to these people. Is despair setting in yet? It is amongst a lot of people, yeah. And I think um, even yeah, cabinet ministers, I think, are starting to realise that the dial is just not shifting. Uh, I, I, I can't remember this happening uh, it, previously. I think, it, 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 I presume it happened to John Major a bit. I'm but not I old don't enough think, to remember. No, I, <laughs> I, I, well, I'm barely old enough to remember. Well, I'm, pl- I'm plenty old enough to remember. But I wasn't paying that much attention at the time. But I think this far out from the election, the polls were not... not not near where, no. where they are and, now. And under major, they did narrow ahead of the election. Yes, exactly so, that. And yes. we were expecting them to narrow at some point, and, and they haven't done. So, yes, will we see them narrowing when they will we do get to an election? It's really hard to know because absolutely nothing the Conservatives are doing is really making any difference to these polls. So, yes. Forgive my lack of gallantry, Natasha Clark, but you are old enough to remember who won among the MPs when it was Rishi Sunak versus Liz No, Trump. I'm not. I'm clearly not. <laughs> I don't it's, think age is your so excuse. So many leadership contests. It was I just Rishi Sunak who got 137 votes from their parliamentary colleagues, and Liz Truss so sorry. Landed 100 and, 113. But that, you know, that takes us back to the smoking vote and the and the future leadership contenders keeping a very close eye on the membership exactly. of They're the thinking Tory party about rather what than the parliamentary next, party for sure. Um, I, I, and, and there it is, I suppose. The to take away from that, the two leaders are both probably going to be able to easily weather attempts to tar them with the reputation of their predecessors. Which brings us to Angela Rayner, briefly. I enjoyed Matthew Paris's piece in the Times today, which I would agree with, but of course the front page of the Times and the front page of the Daily Mail trying to resurrect this story, even if it turns out to be a hill of beans or a lot of sound and fury signifying nothing. Anybody confused about why so much inflation and effort is being put into it got their answer today because it allows Rishi Sunak just to throw it like a sort of... You know, like a, an animal in the zoo throwing excrement at the, at the at the glass. He can just throw it across the House of Commons. It doesn't matter. And it gives his backbenchers something to cheer about. Yeah, and I think it was, in, in fairness to him, I'm sort of glad he didn't go quite in as hard, and hard as Angela as some people may have expected him to do. So I think probably making a, a slight joke about it probably was the easier way to get around that subject of touching on it but not going too far into it because Keir Starmer obviously had a response there saying it was a smear on a working class woman and then he swiftly moved on. But Angela Rayner has taken the risk that, that Keir mm-hmm. Starmer took over yeah. the Beergate Curry row of if I am found guilty, I will quit. And look, the, the revelations that are on the front page of the Times today that this investigation into her affairs is slightly wider than we did think it was. There are lots of officers, according to the Times, 12 police officers working on this investigation. Uh, whether it's a good use of taxpayers' money or not is a very, very different question. But, mm. you know, if she is found to have broken some rules, you know, they're taking a big gamble. And Sir Keir Starmer, to me, seemed pretty confident that he thinks that she's going to be completely exonerated. And she, looks, she looked quite comfortable there sitting but, next to him today. What is that little remark? He is, was the director of public prosecution. So it's hard to imagine a, 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 a CV better suited to reaching a conclusion on this kind of issue. But hey-ho, never say never. Natasha Clark, many thanks. Half past 12 is the time. Uh, John Sopel up next to talk us through Donald Trump's latest travails on the other side of the Atlantic. Joining me in the studio, you won't want to miss that. But first, Tim Humphrey has your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. 32 is the time. A few of you reflecting on the absence of uh, uh, questions about the situation in the Middle East at PMQs. I suspect, well, I, I think it is because the two leaders are largely singing from the same hymn sheet on that. So there's very little uh, leverage, if you like, for uh, Keir Starmer to, to come after Rishi Sunak for what the government is doing and, and to, to a lesser extent, vice versa. Um I, I, I'm joined in the studio now by John Sopel, star of the news agents and indeed the news agents USA. And uh, and and uh, until uh, turning up in this parish, he was of course the BBC's North America editor, which means that you watch events in America still, John, with even more interest than the rest of us do. It's very hard to keep up 
with, with, with Donald Trump's legal travails, never mind his political situation. So the legal situation is that he faces four criminal indictments with 91 separate criminal charges. And one of those cases, perhaps the least serious of them, which is that he paid off a porn star and never declared it as election expenses, has actually started in New York now. The other three cases might not happen before the presidential election. But we are treated to the spectacle now of Donald Trump as a criminal defendant having to appear in court just like any other criminal defendant in a dingy courthouse in Manhattan on the 15th floor as potential jurors are going to be examined to see whether they are fit to sit on the jury to try Donald Trump. And the mighty, powerful, big, muscular Donald Trump looks a rather shrunken figure in this courtroom. And, and that is not what some people were expecting or predicting. There's a, a, a lot of talk about how it would embolden him or, or, or play well to his. But I like the way you've, 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 you've described it as something that his supporters won't like the look of. Well, I mean, you know, there have been reports that in the first two days... Monday and Tuesday, that at times he's fallen asleep. His eyes have kind of closed, his shoulders have slumped, his head's tilted forward and his mouth has lolled open. That is not the image that Donald Trump wants to no. project. And, you know, all the court reporters that are there are reporting on it. It's not being televised, so you're not going to get that television drama. Yeah. And it's obviously difficult to swear in a jury of 12 people who don't have a view on Donald Trump who can promise to be impartial. Because Donald Trump himself, having tried and failed to get the case delayed and kicked into the long grass. He's then gone after the judge. He's gone after the clerk of the court. He's gone after the witnesses. And it has led to the judge warning Trump that he could be in contempt of court because apparently yesterday he was sitting glowering mm. at potential jurors. And, he, and the judge, you know, where, whereas Donald Trump has been able to run roughshod over the political rules, over the judicial rules, it's more difficult. The judge is in charge in that court. And, and I mean, to, to, to that point, seven jurors sworn in already. They need to find five more and six substitutes. Yeah. Right, the process not quite as easy as it would be in a normal case. No, well, not as quite as easy in a normal case. And this also speaks to the American justice system, whereby, you know, there is a kind of immense vetting going on of anyone who's going to sit on the jury. There'll be background checks that the prosecution and the defence will be doing to find out whether they've got allegiances or kind of have been paying money to a political party or whatever. So that will that will be going on. But it looks like the actual opening statements in the case could come as soon as next Monday. And the huge question, will Donald Trump's defence team dare to put him on the stand yeah. to give evidence? Because that would be it's <laughs> astonishing. But you're going to hear from his former lawyer, Michael Cohen. Um, well, just remind us what's happened to Michael Cohen with reference to this story in so, recent years. So Michael Cohen himself was Trump's personal attorney. Uh, he lied on Donald Trump's behalf and was sent to prison and then was uh, let out of prison, but has since then become absolutely determined. And Donald Trump... L lied about this case, yes. about the Stormy Daniels... Yes, and that, he, yes, that there no off. money was paid. And it was... And, and, and Donald Trump... I mean, and Donald Trump has lied about it as well. I mm. mean, and I say that advisedly. Yes. Donald Trump was on Air Force One coming back from Mar-a-Lago. He was asked, did you know anything about the $130,000 paid to Stormy Daniels? He said no. Michael Cohen has since produced the checks signed by Donald J. Trump. So Donald Trump hasn't exactly. I mean, it <laughs> set me off again. It's I know. Just, it's just, so, so his defence then becomes, oh, okay, yes, I did, I did I know it, about it, yeah. but I was paying my legal fees. I didn't know that this yeah, was, it was the money. It was a business expense. Yes. It wasn't a political expense. It was just the kind of mistake in the accounting line. And that is where Donald Trump has a point, because right. there are two types of offences in the U.S. justice system, criminal justice system. There is a misdemeanor. And there are felony offences. And the at district attorney, Alvin Bragg in New York, has gone after Trump that this is a felony offence, i.e. could be imprisonable rather than just a slap on the wrist. It's, I guess the difference between a district court and a crown court over yeah. what you can prosecute over. And, and I think that the, Alvin Bragg, the district attorney, has set the bar very high.
Whereas most people would say, actually, what Trump did, yeah, of course it was wrong. Of course it was. It, but, you know, frankly, let's not pretend this is something that he should be imprisoned for. And that's why I say it is the weakest of the four cases. The other ones about election interference and squirreling away secret documents are much more serious. But I don't think those will come to a conclusion before the presidential election in November. OK, but th- th- so this one is not about electoral interference. Sorry, I'm being a bit dozy. This all happened before the election. No, I know, but isn't, isn't it partly... Isn't well, it like it, saying if people had known the truth about Stormy Daniels, that would have affected the election, so paying her off yes, to keep her out of the news was electoral interference? But say compared to ringing up the, uh, yeah, the yeah. Secretary of State <laughs> in Georgia <laughs> and saying, an I want you vote. to find me 11,780 yeah. votes, please, okay. it seems like small beer. And so this is the, the, the porn star case, the others are the election interference case. But yes, you're absolutely that. right. You know, the reason why Donald Trump didn't want this public, there is a reason for it. He didn't want it to come out that he'd paid off a porn star who was alleging an affair and had paid her off $130,000 to keep her her stum. He still denies the affair. Yeah, he does. And she's quite. um, But there's also going to be another former Playboy model who alleged affair and there's going to be email exchanges. There are tapes. So, you know, potentially everyone thinks that, look, Donald Trump supporters, his base is absolutely rock solid. It's that's true it is but there are an awful lot of people in the middle yeah there, you don't even know how still big in america the base base bases yes and so what matters are independent minded republicans um independents um you know people who just kind of uh, are of no no party but just want to hear and if they see that donald trump is this kind of rather s- shrunken figure and just looks like any other person up before the beak in manhattan yeah, that's really then it's interesting. serious um, in the words of Megan Trainer, John, it's all about that base. Um, <laughs> I, I, I didn't realise that he is required to be there every day. So yeah. that's six to eight weeks, probably, off the campaign completely. Yes. And, I mean, for example, next Wednesday, he has got an appeal before the Supreme Court that he wants to get these other criminal cases dismissed, claiming that he has presidential immunity. And the, the judge in the case in New York said, tough. You're here. You've got to be here every day. So what he's doing is he every time he comes into court, he sort of stands in front of the kind of crash barrier and will speak to the press and give his soundbite that this is a weaponized justice system. This is all grotesquely unfair. And if and dear American people, if they can come after me, they can come after you. I am the bulwark that is keeping these kind of evil people at bay. He'll do that. And he's also doing something else, which is that every time the court finishes, I mean, yesterday he went to a bodega in uh, Harlem to do a campaign stop. Now, I wouldn't have thought Harlem would be particularly strong for his base, but it was a way of kind of bringing up the problems of law and order in New York, which was a way of jabbing the district attorney. So every time after, he is going to use the courtroom and the courthouse as a backdrop for his election campaign because he has no other option. Do you think he fell asleep? Yeah, he, did, he dozed he off. Genuinely nodded off. He was, you know, he's a look. He's a seventy-eight year old guy, yeah. and he's, a, you know, and he had a little bit of a kip. And well, that's the most the powerful court. piece of evidence, isn't it, for the for the for the how is this going to look to people who think he's a cross between I mean, Rambo the, and Jesus? Yes, and the, the important thing is that you know both Trump and Biden show real signs of age. Yes, the difference. Don't we all? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> now the difference between Trump and Biden is that Trump always seems energetic i'm loud whereas you know biden's voice sounds thin and raspy and he can't really get Mm, his voice mm. project and i think that that is and if you get trump dozing off in court and everyone reporting it as such i think that is potentially damaging because the the image that he so loves to project is strength and invincibility and being a defendant in a criminal court case is humbling Uh, yeah Uh, and and finally to that point, if he is found guilty, is is jail guaranteed a, a no. short sentence? Or rich, no? rich people don't go to prison that much in America. Hmm. I mean, really, it's it kind of I know that's a silly generalisation, no, but I, I, I'm sure it would not be that. It would be a fine, and then it would be appealed, and it will take. You know, the wheels of justice in America 
move incredibly slowly if you've got enough money to pay lawyers to intervene at every step in the way. And Donald Trump has. Uh, and yet, I mean, there's stuff we haven't even touched upon and we're almost <laughs> out of time because there are questions over the company. I thought I was that, coming in here for two minutes. You this could is... you come in for 10 hours and not do not touch the size of it because you couldn't. You, there were questions over the bond guarantor uh, as yeah. well. So he couldn't raise the money himself despite being... Saying very, he's got three hundred million very in the bank. Man. Yeah, he got it. I thought I thought he had it in his pocket. Yeah. So he couldn't raise the money himself, and then the company that did, then he couldn't raise it from traditional means. So an untraditional means came forward, and now there's questions over whether or not that is that bond is worth anything. Solid. Or yeah. Or, or, and and the it's this it's not this case that could see some of his assets being seized. That's a different case? Or that, I, that, I, that, those, are di those are two different it's cases. It's just madness, man. So, so, so I have, we have, we've talked about the criminal indictments. I haven't even gone on to the civil cases that he was found to have raped E. Jean Carroll, and yeah. that was a civil case. That yeah. wasn't a criminal case. And also that he falsely inflated fraudulently the values of various Trump properties so that he got, could pay back loans on very much lower interest rates and so he has sort of so he has committed a fraud there and it is that that he has to pay this huge bond for because he's been fined a massive amount and he's he's a, trying to appeal that of course because trump appeals everything and plays everything as long as you possibly can but it is possible that the the marshal service will yes. go round and say uh we'll trump tower that. can we have the keys please jeez um a quick word on Liz Truss while I've got you. <laughs> yeah. who, who has called for Donald Trump to be the next president of the United States of America? Yeah, well, she appeared at that rally um, in, in, uh, in, in just outside Washington yeah. uh, a month or two ago. and uh, With Steve Bannon. With Steve Bannon. And one or two of the people around Bannon uh, were not over... I mean, you know, even though she was saying very Bannonite things yeah. and very Trumpian things about the state and the deep state and, you know, the conspiracy against the people and all the rest of it, uh, we're not overly impressed by her uh, grasp of some of the detail, shall we say. I'm sure they'll change their tune when they read her book. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> John Sopel, thanks very much indeed. The news agents and, of course, the news agents USA coming soon. Um, uh, uh, to a, a podcast provider. Get it all off Global Player. Get it all off the Global Player app. Um, we, we refocus attention next, uh, having a little look at what is happening right now in Gaza, because understandably attention shifting um, away from there to other elements of Middle Eastern tension. But um, uh, I, I, I'm keen to find out how uh, distraction seems too mild a word, but how those events have um, impacted or not upon the people still caught in that uh, crossfire. It's 12.45. James O'Brien on LBC. It's 12.48 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where I, I, I mean, understandably, given the events of the weekend and the question still hanging over what Benjamin Netanyahu is, is likely to do in response to that um, uh, uh, unprecedented attack by Iran, the... <sighs> Well, I, I mean, inadequate amounts of attention that are being paid to what's happening on the ground in Gaza and inadequate in large part because of the difficulty or the impossibility of Western news organisations getting their people into the territory. That already inadequate coverage has perhaps inevitably um, been diminished still further. And yet the United Nations uh, and other organisations warning repeatedly and ever more loudly of imminent, if not already extant, famine. Um, we've been lucky enough to make contact with Tess Ingram, who's a, a UNICEF spokesperson who left Gaza on Monday and, and is therefore one of the few external humanitarian aid workers to have got into the north of the Strip recently. And, and um, Tess is speaking to us from a man in Jordan. I, I suppose we begin with the big question, which may not be answerable, Tess, which is how much aid is getting in to Gaza and how much of it is getting to the places where it's most desperately needed? Yeah, that's the million dollar question at the moment, James, because still nowhere near enough aid is getting into the Gaza Strip. And, and that's an enormous problem because, as you say, we're on the precipice of a famine. It could happen at any moment. So if you look at the numbers of the trucks coming in, 
In March, we averaged about 150 trucks a day. In the first two weeks of April, that's gone up slightly to about 200 trucks a day, but it is still nowhere near enough. And as a good measure, we used to get 500 trucks in a day before the escalation in hostility. So we're still less than half. And of course, the needs have skyrocketed. So um, it's very tricky. And then that little aid that we do get in, we have all sorts of challenges on the ground trying to get it to the people that need it, particularly in the north. Um Forgive me for an obvious, or, or rather, it may be obvious to you. It's not obvious to me. But, but but why is it so reduced? What 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 is stopping more aid from getting in? Is is it there and is being prevented from ingress, or is it not there for for, for whatever reason? Why is it not easier to massively increase this supply? So we have a lot of aid ready to in position to go in. There's currently about 700 trucks sitting on the tarmac in Egypt waiting in a long queue to enter. But the challenge is this very slow and complex screening process at the border. So everything gets screened. It takes days um, and it's very opaque. We, we don't have a lot of visibility on what's happening in that process or what's going to come out the other side when, which then makes it very difficult for us to plan distribution. So it's it's you know logistical challenges james that that could easily be fixed to to scale up the number of trucks coming in so what 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 is the i, I mean the unspoken reason behind that then what what is the suspicion or the or the fear that, that if if it if it if it is easily fixed why is it not being fixed well, we're asking that question and right. have been for six months because, you know, we know that these crossings can op uh, operate at a higher capacity. Um, we're asking for more trucks to come in. It's not happening. We're asking for more crossings to be opened. There's two other access paths that could be opened. Not happening. So, um, yeah, I'm not going to speculate. No, but, fair enough. Uh, so, no, I understand. Yeah. I understand. Um, I, I, what, what defines famine? Test. Well, because you know, people have been hearing now for some time that, that, that the people in Gaza are on the brink, on the precipice of famine. What, 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 what pushes the needle into that territory? So it's a very um, specific set of data that's needed for this international group to declare a famine. They're the global experts on, on when that threshold is breached. And there's a number of measures. One is kind of food insecurity. One is the number of malnourished children. And the other one is mortality. So how many people are dying? And in February, we came very close to that threshold in the north. And that's right. why the UN said that famine could happen at any moment now. And based on what I saw up there on Sunday, we are we are close if not there that, well, that, that was my next question can you can you give us a sort of eyewitness account of of, of, of what you saw in, in both sort of human and material terms yeah so i think the first thing that's important to note is the destruction as you drive through that's the first thing that you see and the sheer scale of how much has been damaged or just completely reduced to rubble is shocking um the, there is not a lot left in the north of Gaza, James, and I think that is, you know, an important part of a conversation we'll have in the future as to how do people return to their homes in that area. But for now, that destruction is shocking and people are really trying to live amongst it, those that remain there. Um, and it also explains why they haven't been able to get a lot of food because all of their systems that they depend on have been destroyed. Plus, aid has been restricted to the area. And then we went to the hospital. Uh, Kamalad One Hospital is one of the main points that's treating children for um, acute malnutrition. And there I, that, oh, it's almost, I've lost for words. Yeah. I saw babies, toddlers, small children who were all severely malnourished. Um, 35 day old baby who had lost weight since being born because the mother couldn't breastfeed because she was malnourished. That baby's now just over a kilo in weight, um, a, a two and a half year old, um, very sick, very thin, and a seven year old girl who um, was uh, very malnourished and we ended up actually medically evacuating her on our return from that mission. So we may managed to bring her back to the south with us so that she can get the treatment that she needs. Um, it, it beggars belief some of some of what you describe and I, I hesitate to ask the next question because I, I, I can speculate on what the answer would be but what what, what does the how, how does this end for them what, what would they consider to be light at the end of the tunnel now and you should probably if you can incorporate into your answer the the, the concerns about Israel going into Rafa mm. So I think for the people in the north, they just need aid. That's what they want. I spoke to a mother and I said to her, what food have you managed to get? And she just kind of shrugged at me. And so I was kind of pushing her for an answer. I said, 
bread? Yeah. And she said, oh, no, I haven't seen bread in so this is visceral, isn't it? I'm sitting here in a studio and I'm asking you questions that, I, I, in my mind, are quite complicated. But if you're hungry, if your baby mm-hmm. is if your baby is losing weight, there's nothing beyond that. There's no light at the end of the tunnel or end game or chapter two. We need to eat. Exactly, and it's as simple as that because. Right. You know, for them, we're all having these complex discussions about ceasefires and to them it's simple. It's just how do I survive today? How do I make sure my baby survives the night? And that is so, is so reliant on aid in the north. Now, in the south, the situation is different. Aid does get there. Nowhere near enough, but we are getting aid to the people of Rafa. But they're all terrified. Right. They know, they, they hear the news of a ground offensive in Rafa. And, you know, some of the people I met have already moved six or seven times over the last six months. They don't want to be displaced again. They don't know where they would go. They're aware of the level of destruction north of them and uh, they're frightened. There was one woman actually who I met in January and then again when I returned last week and you could see that she was losing hope. She said to me, you know, we're kind of at a point of despair that we don't feel like we're going to make it through now. Um, I I, I suppose given what we just said about hunger and and you you draw of course the important distinction between the north and the south Uh, but when you describe the destruction does does your mind even begin yet to turn to the question of what rebuilding is going to involve you're talking about people living on a bomb site living in rubble you use Mm. the phrase because there is no other phrase to use they're returning to their homes but they're not are they because their homes aren't there so so what what, can we get a, a handle on the scale of what if it ever happens, a rebuilding process would would look like and involve? Billions of dollars and many years. Um, You know, I went through Khan Yunus as well, which is the area where Israeli ground troops have just withdrawn from, and that is also an intense level of destruction. Um, Eight out of ten schools in Gaza are either damaged or destroyed. So it's, you know, it's not just homes, it's schools and it's hospitals and it's um, markets and offices, it's everything. And, um, you know, one of the things I was thinking about while I was driving around the north was this could be very easily be my hometown in Australia. You know, it's, it was all of the things that we have in our communities, cinemas, shops, rubble and people just standing in the blackened dirt around it. Tess Ingram, thank you. That seems an inappropriate. Well, actually, no, before you go, do you you fear for your own safety while you're there? Yes. Um, You know, I was in an incident where the car that I was in um, was hit by live ammunition. And um, that is just yet another example of the fact that the systems that are meant to protect humanitarian workers, they're not functioning properly. The World Central Kitchen colleagues were killed. This is happening regularly where humanitarian workers are put in harm's way. So... Yeah, it is a very dangerous operating environment and it is affecting the aid that we can bring to children. Of course. Well, take care. Um, Tess Ingram, UNICEF spokesperson, as I said, who who was in Gaza until Monday, one of the few external humanitarian aid workers to have visited the north of the Strip recently, speaking to us there live from a man. Um, That's it from me for another day. If you missed any of today's show, you can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player, the official LBC app, where you can also pause and rewind live radio. Download it now for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Coming up at four on LBC, it's Tom Swarbrick. But now it's Sheila Fogarty.